All right, how's it going? Welcome to the Know Your Gear podcast episode number 292. <laughs> I have to look. I have to look at the number. I even look, as I set up the show every week, I look at the number and then I forget it just as fast as I type it in. Hey everyone, welcome back this week. I hope you guys had a fantastic week. Before I get started with anything else, I want to let you know Thank you to everyone who submitted or uh, you know entered into the Stumac giveaway that gave you over a thousand dollars worth of tools that I picked out based on what I use every day and a Zoom call with me to go over those tools. My understanding is they're picking the winner now, so you might have a shot if you can go there right now and enter. Uh, but I mean, literally, if you're watching the rebroadcast this, you won't have a shot. But hopefully, uh, I'll get the uh, email live and we'll know who won live. That'd be kind of cool. That wasn't planned, but they asked me if I. Uh, if they want, if I was ready for them to pick the winner. And I said, yeah, and then I, that's why I was a minute late. All right. So that would be exciting. I hope one of you win. That's on the live show. That'd be great. Okay. What else? Uh, if you're uh, hanging out live, you see somebody with a blue name and a blue wrench, they're a moderator. They're here to help us uh, just conduct the show and make sure it's fun and, and moves along. If you see somebody with a green name, that just means they're supporting just like the patrons, uh, they're members that support the channel. And uh, just like you guys can support, are you guys support by watching, but also you can support for absolutely free for a thumbs up. I, I don't know if that matters. I always say that you can give it a thumbs up or not. I always appreciate when you guys ask each other to give a thumbs up. Um, you know, either people watch the show or they don't. I don't think you you guys telling other people you like it helps, but maybe it does. Maybe it does. Uh, okay, we have a lot of stuff to cover. Of course, guitar stuff, uh, early riser questions, uh, and uh, subjects. Um, I'm going to start with something a little. No, no, I'm going to I'm going to wait on that. So so you guys know somebody already super chatted this. So I already had penned before super chat started that I will tell the Wildwood story that I talked about last week. So we'll talk about that. And then I have a little kind of a personal thing to share with you guys. I'll probably do that midway through the show so you don't leave the show. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we'll get into guitar stuff. So uh, let me let me get into the guitar stuff. Let's do this. Uh, guitar stuff. Um, first, most important. Early riser questions. Let's get into those real fast. Uh, these are people who come in early and uh, and leave questions for me. Uh, and sometimes they email them throughout the week. You can email questions at Ask Know Your Gear. However, I would like to point out Ask Know Your Gear at gmail.com. We do not respond back, or at least we haven't been in a long time. We just put them in folders and then I pull from them. Uh, and if there's a question, I go, oh, that'd be something to address. That's, I have it here on my notes this week. So if you want to submit a question during the week, you can do it that way as well. Uh, anyways, uh, this one came from Mr. I think it was Mr. East, who is a new, uh, member. I saw the new member. Thank you. Joining it says ever play an asymmetrical neck played one in a handmade guitar in LA the other day. And it was so comfortable. Thumbs go where the uh, thick point is. Yes. Uh, so asymmetrical neck. Yeah, I have played. Um, obviously, um, the music man, uh, uh, access guitars are asymmetrical, uh, next. And I've played a few other models of different brands over the years. Technically, uh, in a weird way, the, um, indoor neck by St uh, Strandberg is also an asymmetrical neck, but not in the traditional asymmetrical sense. Um, if you guys watched, um, I have a couple videos, uh, out there. One is probably like things you don't know about the Wolfgang. Um, and it might be in there or, but it's definitely in my review of the, um, access the sterling access i talk about the fact that it's not only asymmetrical but it's called the access because the machine that makes the asymmetrical neck for music man is was called access uh, and that's where that came from by the way that's a little fun fact for you uh it was really cool so a uh, little 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 trivia for you a little trivia for there they worked that out um my understanding is that was kind of like based on the fact that uh eddie's necks were kind of asymmetrical when they were making the prototype of the access music man for eddie his they noticed his necks were shaped a little funny and that was because you know he sanded his own necks and maybe he did it that way a little bit maybe they kind of you know made a couple prototypes and stuff like that but either way uh I'm not saying that's what originated. I'm just saying that's what that machine is, and that's why it has the name Access, and that's where it goes. So if you ever want to try an, ax uh, an asymmetrical neck, and I'll get to what that is in a second because I'm sure a couple of you are like, what is he talking about? Um, you can try a Music Man uh, Access, either the real one, real meaning the USA expensive one, or the Sterling, the more affordable one. So um, what asymmetrical means is basically uh, instead of taking uh, – 
I'm going to use this logic, please, just because I have to use no visual aids. Picture, picture a circle. We cut the circle in half, and you say the bottom half is the uh, the way that the underneath the neck, right? Like a C shape, right? Or a U shape or, or, or a D shape. Asymmetrical would be like we took an egg, right? Kind of like my head, and then turned it sideways and cut that in half so that the so that when you hold it, it's like kind of like the thicker sides on where your thumb goes and the thinner sides goes where your finger is. And it's just contoured to your hand a little better and differently. And uh, and if you really, really want to know, you can watch my review of the Sterling Axis from a couple years ago. Whenever I do my deep dive reviews, I, like I said, I always try to put one like educational tidbit in there besides what is just a review of that guitar or details about that guitar, always something kind of piece of history or a piece of information. So that's, uh, that's where you can learn that stuff. Okay, thank you for that. That was a great question. Uh, next pin question, or I should say early riser question was, uh, RadFurry23G says, can you, can we, <laughs> can we, not me, can we hear your opinions, my opinions, on maple versus roadwood, rosewood fretboards? I don't mean to store, start a tone wood debate. However, feel free if that's part of your opinion. Just curious, rock on. Yeah, it's pretty simple. If you look behind me, you see tons and tons of not maple. So I, uh, I, um, uh, I've just guitars on off camera and, and on camera. Let me count. I got one, I got two, three, technically four because one's roasted. Four, five, well, uh, uh, five maple necks here in this room. And then everything else would be, I think, every single neck except for the Gretsch. So the Gretsch in the N4, the Nuno, is ebony and. Yep, everything is rosewood except for those two ebonies and whatever I just said was maples earlier, five or whatever. So uh, rosewood is the dominant one. Why? I just like the way it feels. That's it. It's just literally a feel thing. Um, the uh, I love uh, un, uh, unlacquered maple necks, like the feel of maple necks. Um, when I say feel, I mean literally the feel of the fretboard, obviously, we're talking about the fretboard. Um, when I'm doing bins, and uh, sometimes, you know, if you have really jumbo frets, that's really cool, you don't feel anything, right? But sometimes you have medium jumbos or even smaller frets, and um, uh, sometimes the tips of my fingers touch the fretboard, and I don't really like the feel of uh, lacquer or paint on the fretboard, so that's why I'm not a big fan of like the, the, the lacquered or painted uh, maple, clear-coated maple fretboards. Um, natural fretboards. I have natural, uh, maple fretboards. Um, I also just like the look of rosewood, but generally speaking, I don't really have a preference. Like if, a, uh, for instance, like if there's a, um, trying to put it this way, like that Petrucci, uh, guitar, uh, I mean, they have it in other options. Like I think they have ebony and stuff, but that model, that color came in maple fretboard, that's why I bought it. Uh, this Ibanez came with maple fretboard, that's why I bought it. In other words, like if they had it in a rosewood, I would have picked it, but they don't have an option. So not having maple doesn't make me stop. Uh, uh, you know, if I see a guitar and has a maple fretboard, I don't not buy it. I just prefer rosewood for the aesthetics. Um, that's about it. Uh, ebony, I love the way ebony looks probably the most. The problem is, is that I've had personally in my life, I've had more ebony fretboards crack uh, either repairing them for customers or for myself because of the fact I live in such a dry climate, it seems like the, the ebony is the most uh, susceptible to drying out in this climate. And uh, so I try to stay away from them for that reason because, you know, you don't want a fretboard to crack. It's a pain in the ass to fix. And um, uh, so it's just an aesthetic thing. But tone-wise, I don't really, like, I don't really go, oh, this is the rosewood tone or a maple tone. If you're asking, I always say this, I like the percentage logic. If you're asking me, is there a difference in tone between a maple fretboard, an ebony fretboard, and a rosewood fretboard? And again, we're always talking about electric guitars. We don't want to talk about acoustics because that's a different argument altogether. Acoustics is one argument, electrics. If you're asking me if there's a difference in tone, I would say yes, but the percentage would be so low that most people couldn't hear it. And even what you could hear, how much of that could be other components coming in there. So it's not something, like I said, I go for the, like, when I hear somebody say, oh, the rosewood has a warmer tone than maple, I don't disagree. I just don't really care. Like, I wouldn't go. Uh, and, and, and here's why I say that. Uh, that's why I like the percentages. Let's say, for argument's sake, in the tonewood fretboard argument, let's say that rosewood was 
warmer or not as bright sounding as maple. Let's just make that argument. And we're assuming it to be fact, okay? So we're not even arguing whether it's real or not. We're just assuming to fact that maple is brighter sounding fretboard than rosewood. Uh, my argument would be that whatever it was doing to make it brighty, brighter would be so minor that we would adjust that out with our amplifier in a second, right? There's a difference between massive things that are hard to, EQ, you know, to, to adjust your amp. Uh, to me, if a guitar was slightly brighter than another one, you just adjust your EQs on your amp just slightly. The only time I'm concerned with a guitar being tonally different is when it's so massive that your EQ range on your amp is either limited or maxed out. So I don't really, I don't really, like I said, I really don't put that thought process into it. Also, I like the maintenance on Rosewood. It's very easy to maintain, but that's all. Just a preference of Rosewood, but no tonal preference to the fretboard over the others. It's all aesthetic. So, uh, okay. Uh, this one, I don't, I don't know why I didn't get the name. Let's see if it's still at the top. I apologize. I, I grabbed it. I grabbed the question, not the name. I apologize for that. Okay, what was the question? Question was, hey, Phil, Princeton or Deluxe Reverb? Well, I have both. I love both. Absolutely love both. They are two different animals. What I will tell you about them is, uh, for me, um, and this is going to tie in because I, I, I have a video I'm working on right now. Um, my wife came up with an idea uh, besides doing the Instagram stuff, one of the things she came up with the idea is she has been going through old episodes of these shows and going through questions that I didn't answer and looking for interesting questions. And uh, she even has help with it. So there's two people doing it. Um, they're calling it mining. They're mining for questions. So they're going through and mining for questions to see if there is a question that, because I told them, she said, she asked me, a, she asked me a question. She was asking me about why do I choose when I'm going through, because she um, I don't know if I shared this with you, but a couple weeks ago for the first time ever, she watched one of the live shows. She actually watched it uh, live and she was looking at the questions and she was curious later what what drew me to a question over another question. Why did I pick one and not the other? What was the logic? And she was just curious. And I explained to her that the biggest thing for me is um, some questions I don't know the answer to. So, I mean, I don't want to say like, oh, yeah, it's a great question. I don't know the answer. Or sometimes I don't think I can express the answer verbally within the two, three minutes, I want to donate, you know, or donate, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, whatever. I wanted to, uh, donate to this, this time, that time to this question. Right. So, um, she said, oh, so she's now mining for questions that are more involved that she can tell that I couldn't answer briefly. So we're going to do them. One of them was, uh, one of you guys asked, why do I like my Princeton so much? And why have I had it for so long? And she thought that was a great question. So I'm working on that video. That being said, that's coming. So I'm just letting you know the person asked that question that's coming. Um, I own the two amps. What I will tell you that's important to know about the Princeton and the Deluxe Reverb. Um, to me, they do sound different, but ultimately they are both amps by Fender that can sound clean, have great sounding reverbs. And if you turn them up, break up a little bit and they kind of have that kind of little bit of crunch that I like too as well. Now, the thing about the Princeton that I absolutely adore is that the Princeton is a little bit, well, it's, it's, it, it becomes unruly very quickly. In other words, cause it's only 12 Watts. Once you, you know, once you dial in a good clean tone and everything's great and you run a pedal through it, I'm just going to show you uh, illustration purposes. Let me explain this. Let's say I take a light overdrive, a transparent overdrive, no, just a light overdrive. I run it into my Fender Deluxe 65 reverb and, at, you know, running the amp clean at a moderate volume, let's say practice volume at home, I run the pedal and the pedal will be a little distorted, right? Because the amp, the pedal is distorted and it will sound great to the amp and that'll be the end of that. However, at the same volume, not volume on the knob, but volume in the room, if I was to run that same pedal through my Princeton, because the Princeton is only 12 watts because it has a 10 inch speaker, it will push the amp so the amp will compress a little bit. It'll kind of feel more like a louder, more reactive sound that you would have on stage. So I kind of like that. I kind of like feeling like if you guys have performed on stage, there's something that's magical that happens when you're playing a loud amp on stage. I don't, ne I've never liked the loud amp part of the, on the stage. I've always wear, uh, worn ear, uh, 
uh, earplugs, so it wouldn't matter anyways, right? I always plug up my ears, go up on stage. I love the feeling, the sound, you know, the feedback, the everything's about to implode or something's about to go wrong. You know, you're you're playing with, you know, fire. <laughs> it really feels like that to me. Like, you know, it literally feels like, like a like a pyro, like you're like literally have this tone and it's under control. But if you do anything wrong, you know what I mean? It's just going to start squealing or going out of control or the feedback's going to go in a different way or something's going to happen. I love that feeling, a little bit of chaos. And I think the Princeton is, uh, I can do that at lower volumes. And what's really interesting, and I don't want to give away too much because I'm really, I really thought the video idea was a great idea. So I'm working on the video. Um, one of the funny things was, uh, and I will say this. Um, a friend of mine in the industry who builds expensive amplifiers or owns a company who, you know, that builds expensive amplifiers made a comment about me liking the Princeton. And he was kind of like a little like, yeah, you like the Princeton. But the way he said it was not condescending, but kind of like a, you know, what do I know? I like the Princeton kind of thing. And I told him, I said, you know, what's great about the Princeton? It's about the only practice amp I can think of. Like I love, obviously there's a ton of great practice amps out there, but it's one of the only practice amps I can think of that is so pro level that you would see it on stage. Like I've seen major touring acts with a Princeton on stage. I mean, I've seen major touring acts blow a speaker up through a Princeton on stage, but I mean, I've seen them use a Princeton on stage. I mean, that doesn't degrade any other practice amp. I mean, the Blues Junior is a great amp too, but I mean, you don't really see people touring with one. I've seen people touring with like two, three Princetons in a row. I've seen bands with just Princetons. And so to me, it was like, it was such a legit amp that way. Like, oh man, it's, yeah, I'm using it. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not, a, it's not cheap amp anymore, but you know, just for what it is, it was kind of like, oh yeah, this is the real deal. It was recorded so much. It's on stage and you can have it here. And the thing I like about it, and I've always liked about it is that cool factor. But the other thing is, like I said, it just has this compression and this reaction that's happening so quickly that if I was, uh, and, and, and when I go jam with people, if it's a light jam, like there's no drummer and it's just a bunch of guitar players jamming in a circle, uh, I take the Princeton. Right, I take the Princeton until I know there's a drummer that's hitting hard enough to worry about, and then maybe I would take like the 65 Deluxe or a bigger amp or a, you know a Supersonic or something like that, something that would that would hold its own a little better. But that's why I like the Princeton. Um, so that question, Princeton or 65 Deluxe Reverb, instead of telling you which one I prefer, since I have both, and I can honestly tell you, I would never get rid of either. Those two amps have been since, since the day I started my YouTube channel. Not I've had you know, one of those amps, I've had those two amps. Those two amps are, uh, you, and they're literally, that's what I was playing right before I turn on the, you know, the video earlier <laughs> to start doing this. I was playing the Princeton. I play the Princeton, I play the 65 Deluxe. Um, it's just, they're really great. If I had to pick one over the other, um, I would want to pick the 65 Deluxe Reverb. I think it sounds a little better. I think it's a little fuller. I think it's a better amp, but uh, you know, if you're telling me I can only have one amp, I'd probably go 65 Deluxe Reverb just because I knew I'd be covered for uh, louder playing and, you know, at home playing. But if you told me like I only could keep one of the two and that was still going to be my practice, my main practice amp, I would keep the Princeton and a little overdrive pedal and I'm always super happy. <laughs> Amanda says, see what you did? Now my brother thinks he needs a Princeton. You know, it's a... It, it really bums me out. One of the things about the Princeton's that bum me out is the, it's like everything at Fender. The price has skyrocketed. But if you can find them used, I mean, just they're they're a cool amp that way. So uh, just fun, a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, stratified. Okay. Thank you for saying it. I wasn't going to say it. He says, Ryan Adams uses Princeton's pretty much exclusively. Um, I don't keep up with the world sometimes, you know, as much as I should. I'm not like a TMZ person or I don't even have real news, uh, you know, coming into my TV or anything. That being said, I'm aware that something happened with Ryan Adams or something with Taylor Swift, something I don't know. I'm just saying that I know that there's, I guess there he, something bad happened or whatever. Um, but... And I say that only so that I don't have to deal with it later in the comments of this video. Like, hey, Phil, do you know what Ryan did before I say whatever I'm about to say? Uh, I'm sure whatever he did is something, but it's not my, I don't care. 
Yeah. Okay. What I'm saying, I don't care. I mean, I don't know. So it's, uh, you know, obviously I don't want people to do th bad things, but, uh, that being said, that's why I bought a Princeton was I saw when I saw Ryan Adams play like three of them on stage, I was like, Oh, that was cool. You know? So that's the, uh, that's the downfall of the world we live in now is like, you know, everybody who you admire seems to, seems to, uh, you know, something goes wrong and then now you got to make disclaimers when you talk about them so you don't get in trouble yourself for saying hey you know i always liked jello <laughs> right whatever it is that you get <laughs> whatever it is you get in trouble for okay um all right uh Susan says, who is Ryan Adams? Why is he so nervous? Ryan Adams, he's an artist. He's uh, he, uh, he did an entire, uh, covered an entire Taylor Swift album. Um, and uh, obviously, I think something happened. He got accused of something or something happened, as, as it happens out there. That's all I really heard. And the reason I tell you that is because I never, I never, I don't know. So if I was familiar with the situation, I would have disclosed what it is and then we'd move on. I'm just telling you, I'm, I'm aware something happened and uh, I'm sure somebody's going to put in the comments what it was. But uh, anyways, um, next question is uh, Nathan Boone says, thoughts on the DiMarzio, Air Norton, and Tone Zone set. Love that set. Uh, that is what's in my green Nuno swirl. I have a Tone Zone in the bridge and an Air Norton in the neck. Um, that's a great combination of pickups, uh, especially if you have a guitar like the Nuno in four is very bright sounding guitar. And I, I like the tone zone in the bridge of guitars that are a little bright to add those mids and warm it up a little bit. I think I've said this before too, a little fun fact again, since we're throwing out fun facts, the tone zone is the pickup that Eddie Van Halen did not pick to be the bridge pickup in the music man guitar. Um, I got that story from Larry DiMarzio himself. So somebody's going to go, no, it's not. Yeah, it is. Cause Larry DiMarzio told me, <laughs> so he told me that, um, he told me that, uh, the, basically when they were making the pickups for the music man guitar, they got down on the bridge, they got down to two pickups and they were testing the two pickups in the guitars and it got down to two and Eddie picked one and the other one, they really liked it. And they didn't know what to do, so they named it the Tone Zone, and that's what it is. So if you guys are curious, that's what the Tone Zone is. It's the pickup that uh, Eddie Van Halen did not pick. And my memory now is messing with me. I'm trying to think of the artist. Um, it might have been Steve Lukather. If I mess this up, I apologize, okay? The artist. But what's even funnier to the story was Eddie didn't even pick the pickup that's in the guitar. What, what I mean by that is it got down to the two, and then... Uh, I guess, um, I, th I, I, if I recall this st story from memory, I guess it was like Steve Blucher and Larry DiMarzio were sitting in there. They got down to the two pickups and they said, which one do you want? And Eddie said, I don't know. And then Steve Lukather goes, oh, you want this one? And then Eddie goes, okay, that one. And then the other one ended up becoming the tone zone. Um, if I mess that story up in any way, I promise I'll run it by Larry again and make sure I got the details correct. I'm pretty sure that's the, that was the the artist, and that was the situation. Uh, so, you know, when he told me the story, uh, I was really focused on the, what, the tone zone was this? <laughs> I'm like, I love the tone zone. That was the one that Eddie passed over. <laughs> so, uh, and so you guys know, a little, a little other little tidbit is that the pickups that are in that Music Man are still the pickups that Eddie picked to, to this day. That's that they still use in Music Man, those two, those two pickups. So good, good combination, obviously, is what I'm trying to say. Tone zone, Air Norton, or Air Norton. I have that combo in, uh, I think that guitar, I usually had it in two guitars, but I think I have that in one guitar and then another guitar, I have a tone zone and a, um, uh, a path. And of course I always call the PAF from DiMaggio path because, uh, it's my little inside joke. So, uh, okay. Okay. Next question. <laughs> Next question is, Um, this is from someone who just wants me to know that cheers from Sweden. I just wanted to do this call out. Um, uh, uh, your live broadcast always starts at midnight local time in Sweden, but that's, uh, but what is late hours for a Viking in the cold winter? I just wanted to say thank you. That's uh, really cool. It's always crazy when you hear like somebody from another country or far away is watching this and you're like, this is so weird. Um, I'm in shorts and a t-shirt right now. <laughs> actually, <laughs> actually, um, 
Yeah, I'm in shorts and t-shirt. I the, although it's a little chilly for Arizona today. Today I think the tonight I think the low here will be uh, 39. Uh, which is pretty chilly for us. I'm pretty sure that's what I thought I saw in the highs are in the 50s today, which is pretty chilly for us. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. We still wear shorts. We just wear a hoodie now. <laughs> it takes a lot for you to finally go, I'm not wearing shorts and a t-shirt. I'll just, so. Um, okay. And uh, how are we doing? We're doing good. We have 800 people watching. Okay, I'm going to share a personal thing with you. I want to share this with you guys. This is something, a little proud papa stuff I want to share with you, and uh, it's to help. Uh, I'm asking you guys to do a little uh, help for me. So uh, for the last couple of weeks, I've been, I've been, my daughter and her friends uh, have an, a, an econ project at, at their high school, right? My daughter's a senior in high school. And um, they were told they have to make a parody song, and... Um, and they don't know how to do anything. So, you know, they, they don't really, they don't know how to sing and they don't know how to write lyrics and they don't know how to, they don't know how to edit. They didn't have, you know, how to film. And so I was able to help them a little bit, a little bit nice, right? I, you know, I gave them some information. They used the room here to film and they made a parody song and, uh, they were really upset cause they were like, they can't sing. And I was telling them about when, when I was a kid, there was an artist that did that. You, you got what I need. <laughs> You say we can't be friends, right? Just sing badly. Just do it. Own it. And uh, these girls killed it uh, on this video. And um, I was so proud. My daughter raps in the middle of it, you know, which is, uh, if you know my daughter, well, you, you know, you don't know my daughter, but <laughs> she's, uh, they're not, my kids are not as outgoing as I am, <laughs> right? They're a little bit more introverted for sure, both my kids. Uh, and so watching my daughter not be introverted was really cool. And, um, so then what happened was they made the video. I love the video. And then what's happening for them is in their econ class, if they share it with friends and family, in other words, they get clicks on the teacher's uh, video because it's a teacher doing this because it's their project. I'm not really sure how this all ties in. Although I will tell you this, I think you learn something because they're singing it to you. Anyways, uh, I'm just sharing with you guys. I put a link to two, there's two links down below. You can watch the whole video. If you show so like, if you want to help, uh, please give it a thumbs up, okay? Because they get it's extra credit. It's not like they're trying to grow a subscriber channel or anything. But also, I also put a clip. It'll say clip if you just want to watch the part where she wraps in the middle of the part that I I was pretty cool. Um, they ha you know they have to work on their stuff. It was their first video, so the sync up of the uh, of the audio and the video and of course all the stuff. But I mean, it was just really cool to see and. Um, I don't know. I just found the whole thing kind of fun. And I think most people watch it and you'll, you'll be entertained. Like I said, they really pushed through this, um, considering they didn't know how to sing. And obviously that's why everything sang very flat. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, so I don't know. And anyway, very good. And, uh, you know, she used my room. So at the end you'll see some of my guitars and stuff, I guess is kind of cool. Uh, there you go. So I thought I'd share that with you. Uh, if you guys would just click that and give a thumbs up. I think if she gets a couple hundred more views, uh, they'll get extra credit or something, which is good. It's good. We're helping. See how, how silly is that? You can click on a video and put a thumbs up and some kid gets extra credit. I don't know if I understand the world today, but you know, as a, as the father, I'm going to, I'm going to just do it and then mention, Hey, look at that. I got the Barry Manilow mug out because he writes the songs. So there you go. Uh, click the link down below if you want to give them extra credit. Um, somebody says, where is the link? It's in the description. You can't miss it. Or you can, uh, but there it is. Wait. Okay, let's go back. We, ha uh, somebody says, where do I view it? It's all in the link down below. <laughs> it's, it's all, I have uh, directions for everything down below. Um, Unfreaking Believable says, yeah, it's a fun video and, it, and the shots uh, with shots in downtown Phoenix. Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, they filmed everywhere in Phoenix and so you get to see Phoenix and stuff. It was pretty cool. Like I said, it's just a bunch of girls having a bunch of fun, which was fun. Uh, okay, let's go to the next, go back to guitar questions and guitar. The next question is uh, from Nick Johnson who says, hey, Phil, do you ever think the classic Gibson and Fender models will be outshined by the new uh, by new things like PRS and Reverend. Um, you know, the cynic in me always says no, right? That's the first thing, right? Uh, it seems like, I feel like, it, it, I feel like 
because you're because I'm old because I'm old, you know, right? You know, you kind of feel like uh, you have this old way about you of saying, no, that's the way it's always been. But I kind of feel like if somebody was going to dethrone Fender and Gibson, wouldn't it happen by now? I mean, let's be honest. I mean, you know, there was some pretty cool guitars in the 80s, uh, even the 70s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. I mean, way more uh, impressive than what's come out in today's age. What's what's nice about today, like I don't look as, as someone who's repairing guitars and working, put your hands in them, looking at guitars and technology and guitars. I don't marvel at what they've done to advance the guitar. I look at like how, what they've done to make the guitar more affordable. That's what's really impressive, you know, right? Um, and not just the whole, hey, they sent it to Asia and found cheap wages. Um, that's that's a part of it, of course. There is that factor, and of course, that's that's the factor we hate the most. But there is other factors, CNC machines, technology changes, you know, uh, in, in making stuff and making materials, you know, um, uh, you know, different learning to use different types of woods that make more sense, you know, and not on a traditional base of like, hey, traditionally, this is the wood you use. And this instead of saying, hey, this is a wood you can source a little better, a little cheaper, a little easier. And deep down, you know, you can give a result that's really good at the end. Uh, p paints that cure a little faster. I mean, there's a lot of things that have advanced the cost cutting part of guitars more than just, you know, cheap labor. Uh, there is. So, my point is, is that when you think of guitars today, like when I think of Reverend, they're great guitars, of course, but I don't know if they're, you know, I don't know if they're going to be revered more than may a Gibson or Fender Strat will be, or will the Paul Reed Smith uh, do that? The one thing that Paul Reed Smith guitars has that is different than a lot of guitar manufacturers when it comes to the whole longevity of value of icon iconic value. Okay. And this is uh, something I've been saying for a long time. And I, uh, is that because Paul has owned PRS, uh, longer now than Leo Fender owed F owned Fender. Then Ted McCarty, I think owned Gibson at this point, he's one of the longest owners of a major brand of guitars especially a figurehead type owner where it's just the owner, you know, you just Paul Reed Smith, you know, you know, not like the family, right. Uh, you know, it's the owner. So you gotta understand he's been with this, his own brand for a long time as the face of that brand. And that's good. But ultimately what may happen that's sad to talk about, but it's just a reality of this discussion is, and it's probably gonna be a long time away because he's still a young guy. That's one thing about Paul's like 60, 62, something like that. He's still a young guy. Um, when he passes, especially if he doesn't relinquish the reins of Paul Reed Smith between now and that hopefully long time before his passing, he'll pass while still ha having his brand. That may catapult his brand the same way when an artist bot, uh, passes on, right? Because there'll be this immediate like connection to people of the era, uh, era, 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 <laughs> era, era of Paul Smith, the person, right? Um, so, so that, that is something, you know, to say, people don't talk about it that often, you know, in guitar building, but it's very true when you think about, um, Think about when just people sell their companies off, how that changes the perception of what is, you know, valuable to when it's not valuable. I mean, he, I guess it would change too if he sold the company, but I don't think he's ever going to sell the company. So the reason I say that is let's, let's talk re realistic now. We'd be talking at least 30 years. Okay. So 30 years from now, that's a safe bet. That's a nice long uh, life for Paul to continue on for a long time. So let's say 30 plus years from now there is a Paul Reed Smith and it is no longer ran by Paul Smith himself for whatever reason. Let's say he just retires or whatever. Um, that I think will catapult the brand into that level of there was a time where people, musicians will say like, I have a Paul Smith era PRS. This is, you know, like pre CBS, right? This is pre Paul Smith. This is post Paul Smith PRS. I think that could happen. You know, the, the sad thing is, I think the real, real, the real thing to understand more than anything else, which is why I love these conversations about talking about quality 
and I talk about collecting because they are, in my opinion, mutually exclusive from each other for when it comes to value, right? Quality should equal to value, but that's not how it works in most cases, <laughs> right? Collectability equals to value, right? Um, like uh, I watch, I watch it all the time. I see it all the time. I see the same videos you see all the time. I see, there's no reason. I love this statement. It's said all the time. And I'm never, I'm not poking fun at these channels that say it, but it's always a channel that says, there's no reason a Gibson should be three grand. And I'm like, yeah, there's absolutely a reason why Gibson has to be three grand, a Les Paul. It's because it used Les Paul as two grand, right? If it didn't hold value, they wouldn't raise value. They can't sell a guitar for cheaper than somebody wants to sell it for used. That's insane, right? Um, I mean, we saw a little bit pandemic, right? You were scratching your heads, right? All of us. I mean, there's 852 of us right here live. Tell me how you weren't not scratching your head for the two years during the pandemic when half the questions on this channel were, but Phil, I can buy a brand new Fender for $900, but used, everybody's asking 980. And you're like, yeah, no sense. Well, here's the problem with that, right? No company would ever, why would you do that? Why would you sell your guitar cheaper than everybody else used, right? That's what happens to a lot of products when they're not, uh, you know, this happens with pedals all the time. They price a pedal too low, they're 200 bucks and they sell out in a minute. Next thing you know, all those pedals are out there to be resold for, for more money. So, um, so essentially, <laughs> I'm not old, I said, I'm vintage, says Rolex does all the time. Oh, but you have to read the story about Rolex, right? When he died, he donated it all to a charity. They're like a 501c charity now. So they're not going to ever care, right? That's that's a different, that is a great, uh, by the way, that's a great um, point. However, that is a very isolatedly, differently weird thing situation. Um, and by the way, uh, Gary says Paul's 66. Hey, he looks great. I thought he was like barely, I thought I, he looked barely 60. I mean, he doesn't look 60 to me at all, but he looks barely 60. You know, like he's getting there. Um, okay, so back to the importance of this is, uh, part of the thing is, is that when you make something that people want and they collect it and they want it and they use it, that holds value. It has resale value and that resale value drives its, its, uh, its, its new prices up. That's just how that works. So, Essentially, a Gibson Les Paul being worth $3,000, the worth is never really the quality aspect or the rarity of it. It's just that it, when they sell it, it doesn't devalue too much. And it's just what Gibson can bring to the table. So, so my point to your question is, Reverend and um, Paul Reed Smith. I think if I was going to give a guess to those two companies, and I don't think that you were asking me about those two specific companies, I think you were talking about in general newer companies, I would say Paul Reed Smith Guitars has the closest chance to being the next Fender Gibson. But notice it's not because I said, oh, because they make great guitars, or oh, because, you know, uh, any other logical reason. It's going to be an illogical reason of, as pre Paul Smith guitars are now worth a fortune. <laughs> right? Um, it already kind of works that way now. There's already certain PRSs that are worth more money because of that. Um, so that's a, a thing too. Uh, and uh, in Reverend's the same thing. They, Reverend will probably happen with Reverend is because they make their guitars at Mir in, uh, no, yeah, Mir. Mir makes them in, uh, in Korea. Like if Reverend was to go to Indonesia or China, then the, Re the Korean ones would go up in value and that would help too. There is an owner of of Reverend, and of course, the same things can happen. He could sell off the company or, uh, you know, uh, leave the company in all kinds of ways, and it could affect that way. But um, yeah, Jim says the guy who has, I'm getting sidetracked here, but the guy says, uh, Jim says the guy who has Rickenbacker's had it longer than Paul. Well, yeah, I didn't say no one had it longer than Paul. I'm just saying he's one of the rare ones out there. But more importantly is this, you just proved my point. The guy who has Rickenbacker, you don't even know his name. <laughs> That's my point. Nobody knows his name, right? Um, uh, there is very, he, like I said, Paul is not just the guy who owns Paul Reed Smith guitars. Paul is out there. So everybody knows him. He's out there. He's in your, you know, he's in your feeds, not just social media. He was out there before social media. He's been, he's an active, he's, he's very apparently, you know, out there. And so that's going to have an effect. Um, you know, and that's how it works. People are going to say they don't like him. And then as soon as he leaves the company for whatever reason, uh, everybody's going to be like, remember when it was so great when he was there? <laughs> that's just how they talk. Um, so it's possible th that companies can do what Fender and Gibson does, but it, something has to happen more than just they make good guitars. 
because I don't believe, and again, this is just my belief system. I don't believe Gibson and Fender are valuable because they make great guitars. I'm not saying they don't. I own both their guitars. I mean, you're looking at them behind me. You know, I, I bought their guitars just the same, but, um, but, uh, that's not enough. Cause I can name a lot of great co companies that make great guitars, you know? And in fact, some of the best guitars I've ever played are made by people out of their garage. <laughs> you wouldn't even know their name. So it's not that, that's not the thing that uh, unfortunately that Gibson and Fender has. That's, that's not how you get to the level where you sell millions of dollars of t-shirts and your brand is your power too. So. Um, okay, hold on. Uh, Beast Rich 501 says the Hall family owns Rick and Bogger. See, there you go, the Hall family. Yeah, right, and the Martin family still owns Martin. Yeah, it's a, like I said, we're just talking about like when you think of Ted McCarty, when you think of Leo Fender, there is a thought. I mean, you can't, you know, some of you right now watching, you know, if I say Leo Fender, what he looks like. Some of you guys don't know what he looks like. You probably just think you do. <laughs> you have to Google it, image it. But you still recognize Leo Fender as this iconic person, not just the guy who owned Fender, right? They, these guys trans, transcend just they own things. They're these people that are in our in our psyche as musicians, as innovators, or people who you know have done something in the industry. I mean, that's just how it works. I mean, there's there's I mean, think about this. When I think of like Seymour Duncan, when I think of Larry DiMarzio, when I think of Floyd Rose, and, and I know those aren't guitar companies; those are guitar parts. But you understand what I'm saying when you think of those people. These are people who who have affected the industry and not just with their products, but with their, what they've said, what they've done, how they've carried themselves. And there's a lot of value to that. Um, and you don't see a lot of that anymore. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah. See, uh, Jim says, uh, that's true. People don't know Orville Gibson, but they do know Ted McCarty. I, yeah, it's weird, right? It's weird how some, some people just get out there and we just happen to know them to some level, know, know them as inventors, but also know them as, as people and as people in the industry. Uh, <laughs> Kevin says, don't forget about Harley Benton. What a good guy he is. So, um, do you know, do you know, I, uh, did, do you guys know the answer? I'll tell you the answer. Like, since we're doing a lot of, Hey, fun fact things. Like I feel like a dad today, a little fun fact driving to the van, uh, the grand Canyon, uh, Harley Benton. Uh, this is real. Uh, this is the real answer. Um, Harley Benton is the name Harley Benton is because when they made the brand of guitars, they wanted a name that would appeal to Americans and to English people, to British people. So they decided Harley was American sounding and Benton was British sounding. So they put Harley Benton together. This is not a new idea, by the way. Uh, Hughes and Kettner is also another brand where there is no person named Hughes or Kettner, <laughs> right? Uh, Hughes and Kettner uh, name, again, another German company. By the way, both these are German companies. Um, Hughes and Kettner, how they named Hughes and Kettner was the two owners decided they wanted an American sounding name and they wanted two names because they said that was a thing to have two names. And they wanted the first name to be huge. <laughs> and then they, as they were talking about the word huge, they came up with the idea of instead of saying huge, they'll say Hughes. And then they wanted the second name to have a K in it. And they came up Kettner. That is an absolute true story. Both of those stories are 100% true stories um, uh, that I learned when I was in Germany there at those two places, at Hughes and Kettner and at Tolman. So there you go. Now you know why Hughes and Kettner is not a real person or pretty people at all, and neither is Harley Benton. It's just, uh, <laughs> just, it's just, I don't know, marketing 101, right? Just, <laughs> they wanted to appeal to somebody, and it worked. Okay, uh, let's get back to questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Stefan says, that's funny and so German. I would agree. I find those, that to be the most accurate statement of that is, is very well. Um, <laughs> yeah, ah, Courier, Courier says, it should have been Huge Kitten. That would be a better name. 
Don't you now want to own, don't you guys want to start an amp company called Huge Kitten? <laughs> so, uh, okay. Uh, uh, Beast Rare says, what is Bujera? I don't know. I mean, we, I know what Behringer is because it's Uli Behringer, but I don't know where Bujera comes from. I could probably find out. So, um, uh, the, the, uh, Harley Benton, I found out when I was in, at Tolman for a week and I asked them and some of them didn't know. And then they said they'd find the answer for me. And that's what we, we, we finally talked to the right person and the guy who named the company and everything. And I talked to the guy who invented the, or, you know, he started the, not invented it, but you know what I mean? Did all the replicas and stuff. And he can, you know, he runs the thing. And then the Hughes and Kettner thing was they gave me a book. <laughs> I have the history of Hughes and Kettner. I, uh, Hughes and Kettner, I, I gave me that book as a gift. And so I read it on the flight back home. And, uh, that's what I learned. Okay. Um, Tessie Switch says Bujera equals Boogie plus Rivera. If that's true, that's cool as hell. And if it's not true, it's still cool as hell. That's awesome. All right. Let me see if I have any more, more early riser questions that I have pinned. Um, and I don't think I do that I grabbed. I don't. So that's good. We can go on to other stuff, other subjects, other things. Let's start with Antique Rocker says, why are there four inputs in my Fender Twin Reverb? Can four guitars be connected at once? Technically, yes, you could connect all four guitars at once, although I would not, but you can. When I say I would not, it's not because it's like an implode or anything. It's just not going to sound great. First of all, what you have is two sets of inputs. So you have two channels. Um, a lot of times we think of channels on an amp as as being just a switch, right? You know, you plug in and then you hit a switch and you're on one channel and you hit the switch another way and you're on the other channel, right? And you're talking back and forth. You got to think of the Fender Twin, like the also the Fender 65 Deluxe has two channel amp, but those two channels are like the old uh, telephone operators. You got to literally unplug your guitar and plug it into the channel. You're like, ah, I'm in the, I'm in this channel. Hey, I'm going in that channel. Hey, that's how you do it. You got to go to the other channel. So you have two channel amps. So think of it that way. You have, you have uh, two sets of two inputs, right? So two and two. Um, so you're, you're going to have, uh, for your left channel and your right channel, <laughs> just keep it that way. Um, but, uh, what's important is then you have the reason why you have two inputs is one input on each side is padded. And that's the best way to put it. And what that means is, um, it's going to be easy. It's always going to be your, uh, left side input is going to be the hottest or straight. I should say, when I say hot, I mean it's straight. It's nothing. So you plug in just like a regular amp, you go, your guitar signal goes in the amp and that's the signal you got. And then if you plug into the right side one, either channel, doesn't matter, you're going to have a, uh, you're going to drop, uh, I don't know the number, I, I, I should, uh, five decibels, I don't think it's 10, but it could be 10 decibels, I can't imagine it more than that, but it's dBs, five, 10 dB, 5 dB, it's just gonna, it's gonna pat it down. So, uh, for instance, let's say you had a really hot, let's just keep things easy, something I can explain verbally. Let's say you had a really hot pickup, like a super distortion by DiMarzio, and you plugged into the first input on either one of those channels on that on that twin, and you're feeling the amp crackle a little bit. You know, the signal's really hot. You could roll your volume control back on your guitar, but also you could go into the second input, and you would notice the volume drop because there's... Um, uh, there, it's going to pad that down, right? So that's what that's for. Now, uh, another reason it's good for that is like you can, a lot of players will sometimes take their Les Paul, the humbucker guitar, put it in the second pad, the right side. And then when they grab their Strat, they might put it in the, the, the left side because again, now, you know, it's padding, you know, that way they don't have to mess with the controls. That's really nice. The reason why I said you can put all four guitars in that amp is, and uh, it'd be good and bad is obviously every guitar that's plugged into those right side inputs is going to be quieter than the left side. For those, all of us remember when you have a friend with two input on his amp and we all went to jam and one of you was quieter than the other, that's what was happening. So, uh, plus it sounds muddy and crappy because there's a lot of signals going into the speaker and in the amp and so, I mean, you know, like I said, so the answer is yes, you absolutely could. And if you're really determined to do it, 
when we would do it, <laughs> when I would do it as a kid, we would plug into a mixer and then run a mixer. And that way you could, and I, I mean, mixer, I mean, one of those DOD, like just four knob, little passive mixers that you can Google right now. It was just four volume knobs, no battery, no nothing, all passive. And you could plug everybody into it and use that, you know, and so, so, you know, and adjust it and stuff. But, um, But uh, that, that being said, uh, that's why you have four inputs on that amp. Experiment, have fun. So keep in mind, those two channels sound different, just like the Deluxe uh, 65 Deluxe, right? The left channel and the right channel sound different. And uh, I don't know, have fun with it, play with it. Uh, okay. Hold on. You guys are talking about DGT guitars, the Paul Reed Smith, David Grissom guitar, DGT. Brian says, there is a DGT on, in Karina on reverb. You guys are selling guitars to each other now. <laughs> I told you, this is horrible. <laughs> It's great and horrible at the same time. Uh, and then uh, you guys are talking about the fact that uh, I did watch the video yesterday. You guys are talking about the PRS video that they put out yesterday uh, uh, with Jack Higginbotham talking about the new Dave Grissom. If you guys haven't heard, the Dave Grissom SE, that's the import guitar, is being released in January. And uh, my understanding is it's 849 for the gold top. The gold top has moons. So just, you know, so dots, this dots with the moons, half nails, or fingernails, but you know, moons. And then $8.99, $50 more, you get a burst top and the burst top will have birds. So what you hear is what I heard as well. So I'm excited about that. I think uh, that is probably one of the biggest things I've seen you guys talk about on this channel for a long time is the Dave Grissom SEs ever since we talked about it, ever since uh, Jack Higginbotham confirmed it, that they were definitely doing it. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. Obviously I think, um, I think it's going to be one of the most exciting SEs. Now, as rumors go, since we're talking, that's a confirmed thing. Um, I also heard rumors that they're going to be releasing some other cool, um, well, actually, let me tell you what I heard. I heard they're going to uh, release in January like a full NAM style, old school, pre-COVID, even though it's not NAM in January, they're going to do a, a, a full NAM release of products. Um, and uh, I have that on good authority that there will be a big product release uh, from Paul Reed Smith uh, across a bunch of products. A bu I mean, a bu it's going to feel like it's going to feel like NAM again where it's like, bam, 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 all these products, like like they full, a full-fledged full, full -fledged launch of products. So, get your pocketbooks ready. <laughs> so, there you go. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> Uh, next question. Next question is from Steven who says, happy Friday, Phil, new guitar day. Been looking long for a first Strat. He's 56 years old. He goes, uh, American ultra Lux single, single, single with Rosewood fingerboard, 10 to 14 inch radius is a dream. Save $400. You know, it's, I think you share, I thank you for sharing that with us. I know it sounds like a silly thing to talk about when somebody's like, Hey, I got a new guitar and we share it. I don't know. It's kind of exciting. I find sometimes it's more exciting for, for me to hear somebody got a guitar. Like, I, I don't know what it is when a friend of mine texts me and is like, look at my new guitar. I'm like, ah, cool. Like, I'm actually more excited for him than when I get a guitar or anything because I kind of feel like, I don't know, just like sometimes like this. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a cool guitar. You know, you're, it's exciting to know. Like, what did they pick and why did they pick it? Oh, it's his first Strat. Oh, well, that's a great first Strat, by the way. You, you, you knocked it out of the park for a great first Strat because that's a great, you know. My first strat was a JB player. <laughs> All right, Vim69 says, last week you told us to remind you to tell us the Wildwood story and PRS. Okay, I will tell you that story. All right, that being said, what I have to uh, disclose, just so you know, this happened in 2009. 
So, um, in fact, I can tell you exactly when in 2009, not the date, but I can tell you this, that I was there for two days in 2009, and on the third day flying back is the day Michael Jackson died. So if anyone Googles that, that's exact, you'll know exactly when I was there. Um, I'm pretty sure it was in June or July um, of that year. And I've told parts of this story as it's a very long story. It's a two-day experience uh, over the show, over the periods of time. And the core, so to catch everybody up to date, my, her pieces of it, um, I was I was uh, called one day on the phone and uh, somebody at PRS called me. This is 2009 and said, hey, uh, we want to fly you out to the PRS factory. If uh, we fly you out, will you and your wife come with us? Because, you know, she's a partner in the store. And uh, next week, next Wednesday or whatever. And I said, sure. <laughs> so we we went and uh, we went and there's a you know, ton of reasons why we we're there. It's a ton of, it's a very long story. Uh, obviously, the biggest part of it, the takeaway was 2009 and the world's, cl- it was crumbling around everybody. And, uh, and uh, lots of things were being discussed about, you know, needing, you know, the economy because it was a recession. So anyways, the, the Wildwood thing and Steve at Wildwood. So I met Steve at Wildwood on, in the van. Steve is the owner of Wildwood Guitars. If you guys don't know Wildwood Guitars, they're a store in Colorado. To explain their store is real simple. In 2009, and it's, it's just like that now. It's a store. It's probably the entire store is 800 square feet. And then it's just, just attached to a giant warehouse. He came. He was one of the first adopters to the idea that, okay, great. I have to have a store and you won't sell me product because that's what happened. You used to have to have a brick and mortar location. Um, it's not as important now, but it used to be mandatory back then. And so in other words, a brand, whether that was Fender, Gibson, Paul Reed Smith, you name it, they would not sell to anyone that didn't have a physical store. So what was happening was he was one of the first companies that figured out like, oh, okay, well, then I'll have a store and it's just going to be really tiny <laughs> so I can say I have a store and I'm going to have a big warehouse and I'm going to ship stuff, right? This is why, whether you realize it or not, this is why Sweetwater has a store in the middle of nowhere, right? They had to have a store too. They have physically have to have a store. It's not the same now and there's some reasons for that. And again, if you want that, there's another store a story I can tell you what store actually created the reason why a lot of the big manufacturers had to leave that way of thinking. Um, but anyways, you had to have a physical store. So, uh, Wildwood, what you have to know is they do high-end guitars and high-end amps, and they really sell very little to nothing out the front door of their store. It's all online. It's all retail. And Steve was definitely one of the first adopters of that business model way before anybody else. Uh, what I mean by that is, uh, when I say adopters, when you guys will put in the comments, no, this guy in Nebraska did it first. I, I'm not saying he did it absolutely first. I'm sorry if I said that. I didn't mean to apply that. What I'm saying is he, early adopters, right? So if we're going to pick the first people that did it, he was definitely one of the first. And uh, anyways, uh, the important thing to understand is that a lot of stores were like, m- my store is a, what was called a mid, mid-tier store. So it's a small store, but did mid-level business. And his store is like huge, right? Because it does, because it was doing internet. So he's, he's selling, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of $3,000 guitars back in the day, 2009, $3,000 guitars, which is a different guitar at today's number, right? It's four or $5,000 now. So, um, then there was, uh, there was a uh, Teddy from making music in Chicago was there and Marty from Marty's music and, or, or maybe it was Martin from Martin's music. Anyways, the, the funny, weird part of the story is you got to understand, <laughs> like, <laughs> these were all really big, big dealers, heavy hitters. And I was the only small dealer. And I mean, I meaning me and my wife, my wife and I were the small dealer there. But what they were there is they want information. They wanted us to talk to us. They wanted to adjust to the market. They needed to figure out what was going on. At that time, if I was going to guess, they probably had 300 Paul Reed Smith guitars in the warehouse with no place to ship them. In other words, they were building guitars, the guitar that dealers ordered, but it the dealers weren't accepting orders or they were on credit hold. If you guys don't know what that means, it just means that you have a credit line and you're either past due or it's maxed and they can't send any guitars. So you gotta, you can understand how that makes a company very nervous in a recession. So um, they had the dealers out to not only hope that we might buy some guitars, but it really wasn't about that. It was really about talking about the industry and the market and what can we do. And, um, and, uh, And uh, one of the funny things that happened during that was, (laughs) was um, Steve, uh, they told us, uh, Paul Reed Smith had this, uh, at that time, I think the VP was Frank. He may have been the CEO. CEO was Frank. 
And so they explained to us that they were changing a couple of things. And one of the things they were changing was the premium tiers. And again, this is where I said this is the disclaimer. This is a story that's over 10 years old, and I'm doing it all from memory. So I'm going to be very, very precise in trying to give you information, but not misquote anything. So everything has to be a little general because I'm telling a story from memory, okay? So anyways, here's the story. It goes like this. It's like, hey, if you want to be a premium PRS dealer now, you have to buy so many acoustics and electrics and amps and SEs, and that's how you're going to be a tier. And and a lot of us were unhappy because, well, all of us, all of us were unhappy because we didn't want to carry the acoustics. Now, you're probably, if you guys are familiar with the market now, you're familiar with Paul Reed Smith guitars, acoustics now being these SE guitars that are $1,000 or less. Then, in 2009, they didn't have SE acoustics. They only had the USA ones. They were way more expensive than Taylor's and Martin's. So, you, you understand dealers like, we're like, we're like, I, if I'm going to spend $3,000 on acoustic, I want a Taylor in the store, right? Taylor's a proven market. And it was really tough at that time. I've told this story before. Uh, that's when Taylor decided to do electric guitars and then Paul Reese went to an acoustic guitars. And I was losing my mind because I'm like, I don't want electric Taylor guitars in the store and I don't want acoustic PRS in the store because I, you know, it's a tough market. It's the recession. It's hard to sell an expensive guitar in that market. And if you're going to sell an expensive guitar, it's going to be a Taylor acoustic to a, you know, tried and true product that's proven and a Paul Reed Smith electric guitar. I mean, proven products are good. It's, a recession is not a good time to start experimenting with new, crazy, expensive things to put out in the market, right? Um, people are not so easy uh, to, um, not so easy to get them to basically just spend money willy-nilly, okay? So this is where it gets a little weird. So they came up with this idea that you have to buy into these tiers, right? And to be these dealers. And so I didn't know what to say. I was, I was you know, a newer dealer at the time. And Steve from Wildwood out of Nora goes, yeah, I'm not here to pledge to your fraternity. <laughs> I'm your customer. And uh, you, I was expecting you to say thank you for giving you millions of dollars. And instead, you're telling me what I have to do to be part of this fraternity that I'm not going to pledge to. And then they obviously saw he was upset. And I don't know him well, by the way. I've met him that one time uh, over this period, a couple of days. My... My experience of him was that he's well thought out, real smart. Uh, he thinks before he talks and he's matter of fact. So I don't want you to think he was yelling or anything. So then he goes, uh, <laughs> he goes basically after he tells them that he's not pledging to their fraternity and he's not going to do that. He then says, um, Gibson just says, thank you for my money. That's enough for you. Why don't you just say thank you for my money? And uh, I'm sitting there and I'm just I'm just in shock because I didn't know you could talk to somebody like that at that time, right? Because that, you know, as a dealer, I don't know, like that. That's what companies did to us, and and PRS was one of the best companies we worked with. I've said this before. Fender was one of the best companies we worked with as a dealer. PRS was. I mean, there was a lot worse companies out there. Uh, in, when I say worse, in in the rules in which they would, you know, do things, and it was real common. It's still common to this thing, and this is going to tie in the story into something that I can talk about that maybe help small dealers and you guys under small, understand small dealers and then what they go through to this day. Um, and so then he says that basically he's like, uh, you know, if you don't want my money, <laughs> cause after he says he, after he told him he's not pledging to their fraternity, he said, if you don't want my money, I'm more than happy to give it to Gibson. He goes, and they said, well, you know, we don't want you to do that. And they said, let me ask you a question. He goes, no, let me ask you a question. How come, how come, the biggest complaint I get from customers about Power Smith is they don't have a soul. And like everyone's face in the room just dropped. <laughs> he's telling PRS. Now he's told PRS like he's not joining their fraternity and their guitars have no soul. And uh, why I love this story or what happened is I thought, oh, this is it. They're going to kick him off the factory. They're going to tell him to get the hell out of here. No, they didn't do any of that stuff to him. In fact, he had dinner that night with all of us, right? They thanked him for his time and his money. Um, and then that was a big deal for me. And that's why, like I said, the story was big to me because at that time, one of the things that's weird about this industry and other industries do it too. So it's not about, you know, indicting this industry is they always have weird buy-ins. Uh, I don't mean buy-ins, just weird buy-ins. 
Uh, this, uh, in prep for this story, I went to Tucson last weekend with my wife. My wife and I were on the car driving. She watched the show. She said, are you going to talk about that story? I said, yeah. And then she made a point. She's like, you know, you should really bring up, since that ties in, how dealers are made to buy products constantly that they can't sell. And and again, not by Paul Ritz Smith. This is not an indictment of them. It's just an indictment of the industry as a whole. And of course, if you want to know the exact companies, I can tell you then. But the problem, as I always tell you, is that information is dated. So I'd be calling out a company from doing something 15 years ago. They might not be doing now. So here's what I mean by this. You would think that a company would say, hey, look, to carry our brand, you have to buy $50,000 worth of product. And we would like you to carry a good assortment of our products. So if somebody walks in your store, they feel like you're a dealer for a product. That's the, how naive I was as a person when I opened a music store. I thought this is exactly what was going to be said to me. This is not how most of the major, uh, industry works. Most of this industry not only has uh, a buy-in, which is fine, they have things you have to buy. <laughs> you have to buy this product. It happens all the time. You need to carry so many of this. Um, you know, uh, when I carried Fender, they, uh, I didn't carry Squire. I carry, I was a Fender dealer for four years before I carried a single Squire. Um, that was a, through a loophole. And, uh, finally, the only reason I carried Squire, which back then Squire wasn't what it is today. Chris, who is run, was running Squire was really fixing Squire. But, uh, the only reason I carried Squire is because one day Fender came to me and said, Hey, look, a dealer down the street wants Squire. We're going to give him Squire since you don't carry it. And I said, okay, I'll carry Squire too. <laughs> Cause I was like, I didn't want to lose the, you know, I didn't want to, I figured if the other dealer got Squire, then maybe he'll get Fender and I have to fight with him down the street. Uh, why not just keep the brand? Right. And, uh, so I pulled in Squire. And so this is the, the interesting part is they will do things like they'll come out with new products. Again, these are just certain brands. They'll come out with new products and they'll come to you and say, um, yeah, you have to carry six of this product. And you're like, okay, I don't want that product. I want all your other products. I don't want that one. I don't sell well with that. You know, actually a company that did to me, that, that's a great story because they, they don't do it anymore, was um, carrying PV was really hard for us. We couldn't carry PV for the longest time because every time we would deal with PV, PV would have another rule. Now, again, this is not to call out PV because so many companies did it. It was normal, but... I would call PV, PV would come to the shop and I'd say, okay, I want to carry PV guitars and basses and amplifiers. I'm mostly after your amplifiers. Obviously I have a lot of kids that play metal and you make some of the best affordable metal amps. I want to do this and I want to carry your, your, your basses, especially PV basses make really good basses. And they go, okay, well you have to carry PA. And I go, well, I'm a guitar store. I don't even carry PA. So I only carry guitars and basses and that's it. And they go, yeah, you have to carry PA. <laughs> I'm like, well, I, I, I can't. I can't buy, I think, you know, I can't remember, I don't remember what it was. It was maybe $10,000 or $5,000 a PA. Whatever it was, it was just, you're just throwing that money away because I, would, I wouldn't know what to do with it. It would just take up a big chunk of my store and I wouldn't know how to sell it. And then the next year we talked to PV and then it was, you didn't have to carry PA, PA. you had to carry damage control pedals. And if you guys remember, damage control was the company that uh, turned into Strymon. Strymons would be easy to sell. Damage controls were these giant, giant pedals with one tube in them. They're very expensive and no one can sell. And so they were like, yeah, you have to carry the line of damage control pedals. And this would happen a lot. They would just, this is the, you know, um, we used to call it like whatever company it was, we would call it the tax. So we'd say I'll go with the Gibson tax or the, the PV tax. Um, you know, you have to carry this product you don't want. Some companies were easy. Like Boss is a company. So, you know, Boss Pedals was pretty simple. It was buy this many pedals, you get into this price point. Buy this more, more pedals, you get into a better price point. And then you just had to figure out how to come up with that money and buy those pedals. They didn't say, oh, you have to have, you know, 10 TU3s. You have to have two, you know, you know, they didn't say, hey, you have to buy eight metal zones every time you put in an order. But some companies would leverage crappy product or I, it's unfair to say crappy. It's they're always their newest product. Unproven product is a better term for it. And that would be really tough. Mesa Boogie was tough. Uh, Mesa Boogie, we never became a Mesa Boogie dealer because every time we talked to them, they wanted you to carry $1,500 worth of tubes. And we we're like, you just, you're not, we don't sell tubes. You know, you just don't sell a whole lot of tubes. You know, even back then you would go to tubes or more, you go online and their argument was, you know, all Mesa Boogies take Mesa Boogie tubes. So it doesn't make sense if you're a Mesa Boogie dealer not to have tubes. And I'm like, okay, great. So why don't we carry some tubes? Why do I have to buy all of these tubes? And so companies come up with these, these strategies and you have to make choices not to carry them or carry them. And every once in a while you make a mistake of buying a product line and going for that deal. 
and it just wouldn't work. It would be really, really bad. So it was, it was really nice for me to hear Steve say, I'm not joining your fraternity. And it was a lot nicer to watch them basically back out of it. And then that, I came back. I'll never forget this. My wife and I were forever changed. By the way, Steve also bought us dinner at the airport. That's how I remember Michael Jackson died because we were at dinner at the airport, uh, all the dealers, and Steve paid for everybody's meal. And then um, that's why the story connects to why I always wanted to buy a guitar from Wildwood. You know, I always wanted to, not to say thank you, just, I don't know, just seemed like a cool dude and I want to buy from his store. <laughs> so, um, but what I learned from that meeting was from then on, I would basically, we would tell people exactly, I've quoted that, so has my wife so many times to dealer or to manufacturers. I'd be like, I'm not here to join your fraternity. Thanks. I will buy in this. This is why I told you the story, Mike, Mike, uh, uh, Mike, uh, uh, Fuller, Fuller, Fulltone, Full, Fullerton, Fullerton, uh, Fulltone pedals, same thing. He had a rules about what I had to carry. And I was like, no, I mean, here's the thing. I will carry your brand. I will carry it with integrity. I will carry it so that no customer walks in my store and doesn't understand that I'm not a dealer. You know what I mean? I, I mean, if a customer walks in, if I'm a dealer for you, I want it apparent to the customer right away. So I will carry your line. I will carry it well. I will sell it with integrity. But I'm not buying eight, you know. And and they all started doing it at some point. Fender's biggest thing. Oh, this is the story. Oh, I got to tell you the story. So this ties in. So my wife, my wife is going asked me to tell the story and I, I almost, I almost didn't do it. And, uh, and this is what she thought I was going to say. So when I said last week that I was going to tell you the Steve Wildwood, she said, are you going to tell talk about the slides, slide like slide guitars? And I said, no, I was going to tell him about that when he said he's not a fraternity. So this is why, uh, the Wildwood story changed my life forever and my wife's life forever. So as a store, we used to carry Dunlop slides all of you here, there's a thousand of you here. Everybody's tried a Dunlop slide. They're probably one of the biggest slide guitar, slides, like slides on a guitar. And so we carried slides. Oh, we had a display. You'd walk in our store every day, just like a lot of stores you walk in. We had that oval uh, uh, display of all the Dunlop slides, you know, brass and, and porcelain, the clear ones, which are Pyrex and all the different sizes. And we carried them. We were successful with them. It's why some of the reasons why I'm so so diehard for string swing and brands because they were good and I sold them every day and customers were happy and everything was fine. And then Fender one day told us at an AM show that now we have to buy, I think it was, it was a percentage of what I spend a year and we were a big dealer for Fender in accessories. So I, I don't remember the number. I don't think it was crazy. I want to say it was $9,000 is the, is the order we had to put in that day for accessories may not sound like a big number to you. Think about shirts, right? We sell shirts for 20 bucks from Fender. They cost us like $11, $12. I mean, you know, 10 shirts, 120 bucks. So, I mean, you know, you gotta get to $9,000. Think about Fender accessories. They got strings. They got some cables. It, I mean, it adds up. So, so we were running out of stuff to order from Fender, right? We were like, okay, we got the strings. We got all the Fender t-shirts. We got Fender hats. We got Fender tuners, right? And I ordered Fender slides. They started carrying slides. And, uh, and uh, so I carried them. And when we got the slides, I put them in the display with the Dunlops, right? So, because it was just a display. So it'd be like, here's the Fender ones and here's the Dunlop ones. And, uh, one day my wife was talking to a student's mother. They were talking and my wife was, uh, being animated as she's illustrating, like as sometimes you do when you're like, Hey, this and that. And she does this motion with her hand, like her arm goes downward and it hits the side of the, one of the slides in the display. And the slide slits my wife's fingertip basically open and like blood is going everywhere. And I'm standing there. One of the employees are standing there. Of course, the mother's standing there who luckily was like an EMT or something and grabbed my wife right away, took her to the bathroom, wiped her hand, hand up in a, in a rag. His blood's coming out. 
I go to the display and there's a, where she, she you can see her hand must have hit one of the slides, the, the fender ones, and it cracked and just slid her finger open. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? And so my, my wife, you know, she comes out, they, they tell her she might need, you know, the EMT person's telling her like, oh, you might need some stitches. My wife's like, you know, being uh, hard headed like I am like, no, I'm fine. They get the bandages on it. Everything's fine. My wife seems fine. So now that we've taken care of my wife, I got to figure out what's going on with this slide. So I, I'm looking at the slide where it cracked and I'm like, why is it cracked? Now in a second, you, some of you are probably like, don't, probably don't understand. So I want you to hold on because you're about to. I get so mad. I take the fender slide. And one of the Dunlop ones, Ralph goes with me and we go back behind the store and I take the, I take the Dunlop slide and I throw it. I'm so mad. I throw it so hard in the back. This is outside the back of the store in the, in the alley against the wall. The Dunlop slide disintegrates into dust like Pyrex does. It just, just turns into dust. I mean, you can see it everywhere. It's just broken glass, but it's dust. And I take the fitter one, I throw it and it shatters into like, you know, 15 shards. And of course, I'm like, what the hell? The slides are supposed to be Pyrex. They're supposed that's what they're supposed to do. So you guys know. If you guys have a glass slide, this is a story not only about the fender thing, Steve, but also about buying quality and why you guys should pay attention because this was a big deal. The end result of this is this. We contacted Fender told them what happened. They said that they hadn't heard that before. Fender then not too long after that, coincidentally, could be because of that, could be something else, stop carrying slides altogether. And then, of course, now only carry, like I think even to this day, I think they carry aluminum and maybe porcelain. Those slides that Fender had were, were made in China. They were who knows what the hell, where they got them from. And my wife lost the feeling in her fingertip for over two years before she got it back. She has it back now. And if I had heard Steve tell the 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 fraternity comment before that happened my wife wouldn't have cut her finger because i would have told fender i'm not here to join your fraternity i'm not buying your crappy stuff i know what good quality is i tell you guys this all the time on this channel that my little stories and my answers to your questions are always based on these experiences and those a lot of those experiences are horrible um i, I wish they weren't unfortunately and or fortunately depending on horrible stories tend to have the best lessons learned and so when I tell you guys, like when I say I trust string, string swing because they don't fall off the wall, <laughs> right? It's because for 13 years, these, these hangers on my wall were in my store holding my guitars, even if people weren't nice to those guitars. And I see another wall hangers fall out of the walls. And if I tell you guys, I trust Dunlop slides, I honestly do because I would not buy something else. Um, so... <laughs> Brian says, you just remember the horrible stuff. I remember a lot of the positive stuff, but there's not a whole lot of lessons from the positive stories, right? Those are more funny. We'll tell the positive stories for fun. These are more of like just the things. So to, that's the story. I'm sorry for a lot of you right now. Like, oh man, he went on a tirade for a while and it's not a guitar talk so much, but that's the story with Steve. What I learned from Steve, this is why I own a Wildwood 10 guitar, not just a guitar from Wildwood. This is an exclusive Wildwood guitar. I would have bought my small box. He makes the makes exclusive, exclusive Wildwood small box amp, but, uh, they didn't have any. <laughs> so they had this and I bought this. This was just something I wanted to do. He's just somebody that that story resonates with me to this day. I'm not joining any fraternities and neither is my wife. And, um, and, uh, and not, I'm never, I, that story about Fender, I have no stories after coming back from PRS where I'm like, and then we bought in and then we learned our lesson and we lost our ass. And like, no, I learned everything I need from that. I watched him say basically that. And, uh, and what I also learned was from PRS. They, their response was uh, the next year they got rid of that idea. So, all right. Oh, <laughs> somebody says I'm going through my slides right now. Yeah, that would, that would, um, that is a story, man. Like I'm telling you, it was, it freaked us out. It was crazy. Okay. Um, Let's go back to guitar questions. So there's my, my Wildwood story. All right. Uh, the next question is from Litve. Litve says, Phil, is there a bass version 
of the game changer feature uh, feature packed affordable brand name Ibanez. So he's talking about when I did the uh, the Ibanez video recently where I bought that Ibanez in purple and talked about how you know it's really a lot of stuff for the price point from a brand name. He's like, is there a base version? Um, I'll tell you what I will do. Thank you for that suggestion question. I will uh, work on doing a base uh, video of that. Um, I didn't think to do that at all. It wasn't anything on my radar, but that video of course did really well. So of course, even a base version would do well. So obviously it should be, it should be such an obvious answer. Like, of course, make another video like that in a different way. And I didn't even think about it. You thought about it. I'm going to take your idea. I will work on that. Uh, let's see. Enrico says, hey, break down your personal tone pie. My tone pie? Like a moon pie? Like a tone pie. From most important to least, what specs components are most important to you? Would be a great if you could ask this uh, to builders as well, especially Paul Reed Smith or PRS. Um, okay, I get what you're saying. So... He means tone, like a pie chart, right? Percentage wise, that's what I'm getting from this question. What's most important when it comes to tone? It's a great question. Uh, I like to think of my guitar for the most part as playability, like how it feels and how, you know, how I like it and the tone more so coming from the amp. I really believe everything matters. I've said this before. I think, uh, I think the guitar, the guitar matters, the pickups matter, the guitar cable matters, the amp matters, the speaker matters, the room obviously matters that you're in. I mean, anyone who's had a gig knows just different rooms are a nightmare. And there's everything that affects your tone, the overall tone you're going for. But in percentages, what would I consider the biggest thing? I would say the amp and, and therefore the speaker too, right? So the cabinet or the speaker that's in that amp. That to me is probably the biggest percentage of the sound. And the reason is, is like, even, even as something as dramatic as let's say, let's talk in a very dramatic broad strokes, a single coil pickup and a humbucker sound a lot different. I think with an amp, I could adjust an amp so that even if you thought you had heard, you know, even if you still go, I can still kind of tell it's a single coil. I think you can make that single coil sound humbucker ash esque ash esque, and you can make the humbucker sound single coil esque with the amplifier, generally speaking. So, cause the amplifier has such a such a uh, overwhelming control of the overall tone. So I would say amp is probably most important. And I do consider amp and speaker. And if so, if the question is what's more important is amp and speaker, I, I don't know how to answer that since I would, I don't think you can do one without the other. <laughs> I mean, maybe you could, I don't know. So to me, it's the amp and speaker. That's the biggest part of the tone. Then the next biggest contributor to the tone would probably be the pickups, right? And then, and then the guitar itself, uh, i.e. meaning if it's a, you know, a, a solid body or a semi hollow or hollow body, mostly hollow body to semi hollow type of bridge component wise. I, I I've said this before. I like this. Uh, I'll say it a, a thousand times forever. Uh, tone wood. I believe in tone wood. I just don't believe it's a big deal. Like I don't, I believe that if, yeah, if you take a hard piece of wood and a soft piece of wood and you make a guitar, out of, there's going to be a difference. Whether everyone can detect that difference. I have no idea. If, you know, if only one person can hear it, <laughs> that's great. But what I will tell you is, I think before that is a factor, I think components are actually have more to do with the tone than the, the wood. So, you know, when you, when you, uh, you know, your bridge could have more an effect on the tone, the nut, the, the fret wire, the things that are, you know, I guess, I guess if you break it down to its easiest way of thinking of it, the strings are where the sound's coming from, we're amplifying strings. So strings are important. Uh, we already know, I, I've done tons of videos, a nickel uh, string, so, you know, pure nickel string versus a stainless steel uh, nickel wrapped or uh, some of the brighter strings that are brighter materials. Those are gonna have huge effects on what the pickup hears. And and so that's a big, a big factor. And then of course, the things that those strings touch. Um, that's uh, that's really important. I think everything that the everything that affects the string will affect the sound, and 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 that, the reason I say that is this: I was watching a video one night, and it's I was watching a bunch of guitar players talk about something, and I go, "Wow, it'd be really cool if there was one bass player in there." It seems like every bass player understands the concept of where we pluck on the bass, and in, in reference to how close to the bridge to the neck is a huge tone difference. Like every bass player. I, and I feel like I'm pretty for, pretty for confident in this. Every bass player knows when you're at the gig, like, you know, if you're going to dig in, you want it a little brighter, you just 
back your hand towards the bridge and you dig in. And if you want a little boomier, you just go towards the neck. That's just how we move. Guitar players, I, I heard one guitar player one day was talking about how guitar players, some guitar players play louder than other guitar players. I'm like, louder? I'm like, well, if you hit harder, you'll be louder. But essentially where you're picking, right? If you're picking over the pickup or if you're picking, you know, towards the neck where it's, you know, a little bit more bassy versus, you know, the bridge. Some guitar players pick with this constant, whether they realize it or not, there's a constant, a little bit of their hand always touching the strings. So there's always a little mutedness going on. They're never letting the strings truly ring out. Um, I'm not talking about palm muting. I'm just talking about some guitar players just always have what I call control. They're dampening some strings because so they're always trying to just let certain strings play through. Sometimes this is just from years of practice. They just, that's how they control their strings. Some guitar players are just crazy and hit, you know, like Kurt Cobain, just all big chords and big hits and, and there's just let the guitar ring and do what its thing is. And so there's, that to me is a bigger part of tone than Maple versus Rosewood or Mahogany versus Alder. Uh, I think those things have bigger effects. Like I said, the, uh, you know, and then, and then that's the pick. So like I said, because everything that has contact with a string, everything affects the string. So I think that's how I like, if you're talking about a, a tone pie chart, that's how I would focus that pone, uh, tone pie, pie chart is the string starts the sound and then everything is, uh, is either taking away from that sound uh, and so, or enhancing something in that sound. And then that's how I would probably do the percentages. Well, I don't know if that'd be, I, I feel like if I did a video with a pie chart and I was up there with a pie chart, like, mm, this is 30% of your tone. I feel like it'd just be all out pulling it out of my ass like I just did right now. And although I think it makes good for conversation, as a actual standalone video, it just looked like some pre-Madonna guy telling you how he's figured out the, the world of tone. And I don't, I don't think that's what tone's about. I think tone is just this conversation we have about... <laughs> It's just a conversation because, uh, you know, what else are we going to talk about? Politics, right? Religion? No, we're guitar players. We talk about music and gear. All right. Uh, then we have Bradley who says, hey, I have, what do you have, uh, Bradley? Uh, Bradley. Okay, hold on. Uh, Bradley says, I have a Fender Blues Deluxe reissue. When I play notes on the low E string in the first few frets, I hear a slight buzz. Yep, from the amp. Now the guitar. Is that a problem with the amp or stock speaker? Okay, so there's a thousand things. Okay, it's not, it's like three things. Three things that can be causing that buzz sounding. The cabinet itself could be rattling, rumbling, you know, from the speaker, uh, that frequency. Um, it's a fun little crazy thing. Oh God, if I tell you guys this, I'll feel bad, but I'm gonna do it. I'm pulling the trigger. A uh, little fun, little fact, little, uh, since we're doing the dad uh, fun facts uh, today. Uh, next time you guys go to a music store, it's a little hard in the guitar center because it's a big store and it's loud, but you can do it in most music stores. Every music store, if you ever lived or worked in a music store, you know this. And it's every room, period, by the way, but music stores are fun to do it too. Every music store has a, a, a resonance, a, a, a frequency res resonance, okay? So you can take, especially a bass guitar, that's the fastest way to find it. Bass guitar will find it like that, but a guitar with loud, don't need to be stored it. In fact, clean is even better on an amp. Take a guitar, turn the amp to clean, turn it up a little bit, enough to, enough to let everybody know you're here and start, pick a string, low E string, high A string, or low E string, A string, start playing each note. Boom, 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 boom. Just hit a note and at one point you'll hit a note and every single instrument in that store, acoustic, the ceiling, the rafters, everything will go ring. It will just start singing. Uh, and it has to do with, uh, seriously, the construction of the room, the shape of the room, <laughs> where you just where it just happens in every store. I don't remember. I can ask Ralph tomorrow when I see him. I'm, uh, he'll, I know for a fact he'll remember what our store was. So if somebody hits it, it would just literally do that. You could do it in your church if you play at church, right? But it's hilarious because you could, like you could hit big chords loud in the amp, nothing will happen. But if you just find the right note and you hit it, it will just literally the entire, everything in that store will just start. Cause the, the guitars are hanging on the walls. The walls are attached to the ceiling and it, whatever's causing it obviously would just start doing it. And it's really hilarious when all the guitars do it. I want to, I want to say ours was a, but again, I'll ask him. So why does that tie into this question? 
I don't know. I just want to, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, because that happens with uh, amplifiers as well, by the way. So you hit us, uh, so you're hitting a certain note and that frequency uh, vibrates and the cabinet rattles or the tubes rattle. Something's rattling in the amp and that's what's causing the buzz. And if it's rattling fast enough, you get that zzz, like a buzz. I'm thinking that's what you're asking. Uh, not like a buzz, like you're getting 60 cycle hum in the amp. That wouldn't make sense just from playing a certain note. Um, so what can that be? That could be your tubes rattling. So uh, unfortunately you would have to replace the tubes if you don't wanna hear them rattle, but of course the next tubes could rattle too. Or it could be something else in the amp rattling besides the, the cabinet, you also, it could be um, uh, the reverb tank. There is all kinds of things you can do. You can get dampeners and, and rubber dampeners and put them in the amp. And you know, I've seen guys take uh, 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 wood glue and try to wood glue stuff up. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to do the spacers, everything you can in there uh, to, to get the cabinet to stop doing that. Um, sometimes if you get lucky, you can take the metal feet off the bottom and put rubber feet. One of the things I would suggest if you have the ability to is take, uh, I have hard foam blocks. I'm trying to think what else would you could use? Something hard, something that's exorbitant, like almost like a, if you, um, if you have a yoga pad, I know a weird thing to say, or maybe it's not, <laughs> two yo you need two yoga pads. You take two rolled up yoga pads and you put the amp on those. Again, just to make sure the amp doesn't fall over. Um, it, uh, uh, a thick mat, anything rubber to dampen. And maybe like, think about the amp being like a picture it in your head. You're putting your amp on a shock and you're let, hoping that the vibration is just going through and it gets absorbed by that and the amp can't really shake the same way. That will actually probably solve it more than anything else. And if that doesn't, and if you don't have that stuff, you can always change the position of the amps. So we're not where the amp's positioned will help. Um, but the cheapest, fastest way to test it and actually fix it is get that amp off the floor and something dampening underneath it. And like I said, any kind of hard foam or rubber or anything that absorbs uh, vibration would be perfect. That doesn't let the amp fall over. That's what I would suggest. Uh, at 10 says, Dear Phil, please, for April Fools, put together a Fender Strat logo, Lego set for the Lego jar. Um, my, I had my wife, my wife put together the uh, Lego set, uh, Strat Lego set. I bought it last Christmas. Like I said, every Christmas I buy Lego sets and my wife and daughter, and sometimes my son, but it's mostly my wife and daughter, they put them together. And last year I bought the, uh, my daughter got the Friends sets and my wife got the Strat set. I wanted the amp. So I have the amp down in my shop. If you look at certain footage of my shop, you'll see the Lego amp build. She did that. So unfortunately I can't put it together because my wife already did. And, uh, but it was fun. I highly recommend it. It was like a hundred bucks then. It's probably more than a hundred dollars now. It was cool. I feel like it was pretty legit for a hundred dollars. Like I didn't feel like, you know, like it was stupid. I, I just thought the amp looked so much cooler than the guitar though. All right, John says, happy Friday all. Anyone been on a music-based holiday that they can recommend? Oh, fancy a break, but do not, but not sure about flying with guitar or bass. Gold, gold seems to be good for the holidays. Oh, so there you go. He's asking you guys, putting that in the comments down below. Benjamin says, Brussels sprouts been saying hello. Hello, Brussels sprouts. Thank you, Robert, for the super chat. Octopus Ears says, finally got my hands on the steak and eggs. Tasty. Is that uh, is the steak and eggs Dane Electro pedal, I would assume? I watched your video. When did I watch your video? Octopus Ears. I watched, because you know you can't forget a name like Octopus Ears. I watched your video of the Paul Ray Smith HRDX. That's the video I just watched. Good video. Thank you for putting that out. It's always nice to get insights and stuff. I tend to, as you guys know, I tend to watch a lot of the uh, channels where, again, I can, I don't really care about people playing stuff. So is, although I could call most channels, <laughs> it's nice. It's a nice thing to say. I can call most channels that can play amazing friends, RJ Rinkilio, uh, Sean Tubbs, uh, you know, Pete Thorne. I mean, I'm not saying we're like besties, but I'm just saying, you know, like they're nice people. I've met them and I know them. So I love all their playing, but they're not what I'm personally looking for when I'm looking for information about a product. All I really want to know is what somebody's opinion was of it. Uh, I'll figure out <laughs> the rest on my own. So I tend to find channels anywhere where I find that they're talking a little bit. I just want to know, like, I'm looking for you to tell me like, this is what you liked and this is what you don't like. And then if that falls in line with what I was anticipating, I'll go ahead and pull the trigger and buy it. So thank you, Octopus Ears, for that amp video. And I'm assuming you like the new steak and eggs uh, pedal. 
<laughs> assume. If not, and if you, if it, I'm right, I guess you'll do a video. Uh, Grumpy Mike for the tone jar. And why not? In your opinion, is the Evertune Bridge a passing fad or will it survive the market cheers? The biggest issue it has, and I know this because of, of now that I've, I've worked with it a little bit, it's a little heavy, so it adds weight to the guitar. A lot of players are not really interested in that. It's a huge modification for guitars. I can see now... Uh, here, here's my take on it. Uh, and, and I will, I will do a video eventually on it, but the, the sad thing is the quality is not in question, which is good. So in other words, like if you want an Evertune bridge and you're worried about quality, I, I, I feel like the quality is there. If you want it because of, uh, you know, and if you're worried about the, whether it does its job, it does its job. The question is not to me, is it quality? It is. Does it do its job? It does. I kind of feel like in the stay in tune game headless guitars have kind of really nailed it so the one thing is i would say is and this is going to be sounds really strange is that if you want a guitar that you tune and forget about i would say look at evertune or headless guitars and when i say headless guitars i mean exactly that quality made headless guitars right um and because again, there's no tuning keys to bump. The the the, tu the fine tuners are exactly that. They're fine tuners. They don't really move. Once you tune it, you know you come back six weeks later. You strum a chord, still in tune. Uh, the shorter, the, the less wood means less movement, less problems. Right? It's it's just efficiency of that. Um, but I mean, I understand. So here's what's interesting. I'd almost argue in the weirdest way that you can argue something. If you want a guitar that's really stable in tuning and you don't like head uh, headless guitars. Evertune would be your solution. It would give you all that. I can't imagine it's better. Uh, just playing them both, quality wise, like for staying in tune. But aesthetically wise, I mean, if you have an Evertune, you have a guitar that looks like a real guitar. It doesn't look different. You can stick it in a guitar. Um, me, I think I don't know why, but the idea of having a Tele with an Evertune in it is just the most appealing thing to me. So that's what I'm holding out for uh, to actually do the official official review. I'd like to do an Evertune review, not only where I've had it for a while, like I've been working on, but also a I'm going to keep it, and then maybe a year later go where am I at now? Where am I now? You know, instead of a hey, I got it, I did the video. I gave you some insights and I flipped it. You know what I mean? It's sometimes I like to hang on to stuff uh, because of the fact that I feel like that shouldn't be the end of that story for a lot of players that are thinking about purchasing that. But there you go. That's my thoughts. Okay. I have no idea. Chaffee Booms. Chaffee Booms, uh, if, if I'm saying your name right, says, hello, good sir. Can you reasonably refret stainless using a fret hammer? No press, or should I get a press? You can absolutely do it with a hammer. You can do anything with uh, a stainless steel fret. It's the same as as, as nickel. Um, I decided a few years ago when I refret guitars, I only refret in stainless steels. When I did my Palbert Smith Mira, I refret it in stainless steel, not because I thought it was better, um, just because you know I only do it that way. Reason is is because it's kind of like if you're going to do a refret on a guitar, this is my thinking. Okay, when somebody says you have to, ha I hate this statement so much, and I hate to say hate. <laughs> It's like, oh, if it's not stainless steel, it's junk. Look, you can buy a nickel fretted guitar and you can play that guitar forever and never need a refret. It happens all the time, okay? Um, you you know, some players are more aggressive. They squeeze harder. They, you know, they stay in the same positions a lot. That's more detrimental than anything else, by the way. Um, to the guitar, not to your playing. <laughs> uh, you know, just, you know, uh, like I said, you, you when I see... Uh, worn out spots and frets. It is uh, always, uh, it's always the cowboy chord players. It's the guys who are playing, because if you go and play in a jam band or you go and play in a a, 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 a a wedding band or any kind of band like that, where you're playing three, four, or five hours. Actually, that's not even the answer. I'm talking about ten hours a week. You know, right performance because you're doing a couple gigs a week, and then at, you know double that in practice time. Uh, you know, just in the same positions, you wear those frets out. So when I see somebody wear frets out, like I wore the frets out on the Mira, uh, which was really hard to do on a PRS because that material is not stainless steel, but it's very hard. Um, but it's a 2013 and I've been playing the crap out of the guitar. Uh, so if I refret a guitar, I've decided that if I'm refretting somebody's guitar, it's because they wear their frets out less than do stainless steel. That being said, with stainless steel, you don't have to do, it doesn't take any special tools. Um, Nathan does stainless steel frets at a Fender Custom Shop and he will tell you he uses sandpaper. They don't even use files. They, use, they do everything with sandpaper um, because it's cheap. He didn't say that. I'm saying that. 
So in case somebody from Fender is watching, like, what did he say? He didn't say that. I'm saying that. Because they can do sandpaper because sandpaper, you just do it and throw it away. So you can do it. Um, the only thing about stainless steel is, yes, when you use your... Uh, your nippers and your and your cutters, you, you, you know, they wear, the, the metal wears. And also I tend to stab or hurt myself more often with the the bar the the barbs on a stainless steel fret. Something sticks me or something like you know that it sucks. But it's not it's not a big deal. So don't don't worry about that. It's just a little bit more time, a little bit more work, and that's it. That's it. And it, and it will wear tools over the long time a little bit more. I hear constantly people talking about like, not only do you need special tools, which I cannot fathom where that comes from. I cannot find a source of that, by the way. I can't even figure out what's coming from. When I say what's coming from, I don't care if some guy in, in Nebraska with a YouTube channel, eight subscribers said it and it just somehow got out there. Uh, I'm not trying to insult anybody. I'm, I'm the same thing essentially. But what I'm saying is, is that I'm trying to find the source of like an, ex of, a, of a certified, ex uh, Somebody with experience doing it is saying that. I cannot find anybody who's basically saying that. Um, you don't need special tools. Uh, the next thing that comes up all the time with stainless steel frets and refretting is this next statement is, is basically um, that it wears your tools out faster. And again, it does, but you have to understand that is a statement for the manufacturers to worry about. That is a, when you break it down per instrument cost, then you're adding cost, but Ultimately, if you're doing it in your garage uh, and you're doing what would be only considerable, considered a normal amount of refrets <laughs> a year, then it, it doesn't do anything, right? That's it. It just, you know, it's not, if anything, it's those fret and dress files. I can wear those out a little faster with stainless steel. So, you know, so instead of spending $15 for a fret and dress file, I'm going to spend 30 for two of them for the year. It's ultimately not. And if you don't want to, like I just told you, uh, if you buy yourself a $7,000 Jackson, they're going to do it with sandpaper anyways. That's how they're going to do it all. If you guys want, I will try and find the link. And if not, Nathan sometimes is poking in the show. I will find a link to Nathan. He's got tons of videos of him just working on guitars uh, at Jackson. You can see exactly what I'm talking about. You can, you can watch him do it. You can watch him do a uh, guitar like that and uh, literally do it with stuff you can buy at Home Depot. So no big deal there. Uh Mark Hall says, best pickup for a baritone building for my son. He plays metal. Ah, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I'm assuming because the baritone, you're down tuned. I kind of want to say the uh, sentient uh, by um, Seymour Duncan, right? Uh, those, those, uh, those like dark looking pickups have been really cool. I also like EMGs or actives. I also like the, uh, um, what are they called? The, uh, what are they called? The Seymour Duncan active pickups. I like them too. Oh, you know, Fishman's. Yeah, Fishman's would be good, right? So obviously I like active pickups for low tune stuff. I would say the Fishman's are great. I, EMGs are great. Or the Blackouts by Seymour Duncan that I couldn't think of a second ago. Those, if you go active. If you go passive, uh, Seymour Duncan's got a couple of pickups that are really suited for that style of music uh, that really plays really great. Um, that's what I would suggest. So there you go. Uh, Doug says, hey, Phil, hope all is well. Spoke with a very big music dealer we all love because of their sweetness today. Okay, I know. Uh, a PRS SE guitar coming soon. Everyone will be very happy with the price and colors. I, okay, so you probably did this a little earlier when we we're talking about the Dave Grissom guitar. I'm sure it's going to the Dave Grissom guitar. Then again, he could be talking about the other guitar. So there are, like I told you, I would expect to be prepared in January for a pretty large... Na I like the term NAM size launch from the Paul Reed Smith folks uh, and uh, some really cool things. So, and it seems pretty, it seems pretty not hard to figure out. I mean, they seem like they're smart. Like they just did the teaser for the Dave Grissom. I think they might be teasing the rest uh, before they get to January. So a lot of cool things, a lot of cool things coming. But like I said, those Dave Grissom guitars look really sweet. And then some other stuff will probably be cool. Uh, Damien says, Hey, Phil, do, do certain styles of guitars or even individual guitars reject or prefer certain, certain gauge of strings? I absolutely love the term. You don't pick your strings. Your guitar does. I love that saying to do death. I will say it forever. 
Um, one of the questions that, uh, it's not even a question on here. It's a question like, you know, friends, when they come over, ask me, they'll say, what gauge strings do you use? And I go, well, generally speaking, I use 10 to 46s. That's gonna be on the majority of my guitars, but all these guitars have different gauge strings depending on how, how the guitar felt when I put strings. So for instance, I have a Strat that has nines and I have a Strat that has tens. It's not because I go, oh, when I, you know, if I want lighter strings, I play nines and when I want, no, I, they actually almost feel the same to me. They're just some, something about, I, I learned this just setting up guitars for years. And when you set up guitars for customers, you know, your end goal is to get them happy so they can go. So you can go to the next one, right? It's, it's a hamster wheel. It's like, you know, you just got to go to the next, next guitar, next guitar, right? That's how you get paid. So you're trying to make everybody happy. And so what you learned is a lot of people are stuck on, like, I only use these strings, the hand you a pack strings. Yeah, okay. And then they're fighting and fighting with the guitar. And over the years, I've learned like, okay, can we try something? Okay. Can I try a different gauge strat strings on this guitar? And they would try them. And then they would say a lot of times more than not to go, wow. I hate this gauge. And I'm like, yeah, but on this guitar, you're right. It feels how I want it to feel. And I'm like, yes. And there's a lot of factors in that. And sometimes you can adjust the bridge so that it feels like that. But a lot of times, like I said, it's just that way. Um, uh, I was a little on the fence. My nags uh, came with tens and I was just, oh, it was such a, I just was not digging it. And I didn't know if it was the bridge because they use their own kind of bridge fighting it, fighting and fighting with nines. So I put nine hybrids on there and it felt a lot better. So nine hybrids are the first high strings are off a nine gauge set. Last uh, three strings are off the 10 gauge set and uh, felt better. And then I, luckily I, I, what I did was I changed brand of 10 gauge strings and that works. Cause like I said, I used uh, string joy or used Daddario, just changing things up. And that's what I did and changed it until it felt right. So yeah, you can change uh, strings and uh, it'll change the feel of the guitar, but more importantly, yes, some guitars for some reason, man, they just don't like certain strings. It's just how it works. Like I said, your guitar picks the strings, not you, is my uh, feeling. Shane says, Phil, I like my Les Paul Studios better than my standards. Thinking of selling my standards, am I making a mistake? You are making a mistake. So first, I agree with you. I like the studios better than the standards. I think you should play your studios better uh, more than your standards. Look, I get it. No one wants wasted money. You have, you're playing these studios. You have the standards sitting around. What I will caution you is this, and this is my only statement. I want you to think of those standards like savings accounts. Whatever they're worth today, they will be worth more later. I'm not saying it's an investment. I'm not saying you should use that as an investment. So I'm not saying you shouldn't take the money, sell the Les Pauls and invest in something better. I'm just saying like, sometimes my wife refers to certain guitars as a savings account, not because she, <laughs> we're going to get rich off a guitar. It's because I'll go, I'm going to get rid of this guitar. And she goes, you know, that's really kind of a savings account guitar. What she's trying to remind me is, is that selling that guitar today has no advantage unless I, I really need the money right now just put it under the bed and in five years it's worth more. And, uh, you know, and I might want to come back to it. So those are the type of guitars like Les Paul standards are definitely guitars that I say, sell it. If you don't love it, sell it. If you don't play it, sell it, you know, for all those logical reasons. But if you ever think you're going to buy a standard again, don't sell it. If you don't need the money, well then, uh, you know, even, even with the interest rates going up, I would imagine the Les Paul is going to, and you get to play your Les Paul. You don't get to play with your money in your savings account. So something like that. And, and I, like I said, I caution that because I don't want any guitar talk to be more about money than it is guitar and music, but I do caution anybody to sell a, in this, even in this, as the market softens, if you have a premium guitar, like a Gibson Les Paul standard, like an American Strat, things like that, I would be cautious to get rid of them. In, in other words, you want to make sure you're double, 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 double sure you want to get rid of them because um, they're just going to get worse to buy later if you ever have to buy them again. That's really the big thing. Uh, Mr. says, thank you for the story. He's a great story, but I, I translated it that way. Uh, Enrico says, hey, Phil, you missed the pre-show super chat. Thanks. Okay, I got it. I scooped it up, right? Yep, I did. I did. I want to double check I got it. I did. But thank you for double checking on that. Uh, Natasha Ninks. Oh, by the way, uh, thank you for catching a live show. I saw what you said it was their first live show. What model of Kiesel bass did you order? Happy holidays. I did the Vader. And the reason is, is because the Vader came in a 30 inch scale. That was it. Uh, I would have gone any other bass. I'm not saying I don't like the Vader. I love that Vader. But I mean, there's other bases, including headless ones I would have preferred. But the Vader was the only option to get the 30 inch scale bass. 
So, uh, should I put in the comments down, should I put a picture of the Vader base, uh, the new Kiesel base? The video is not ready for launch, but should I put the pictures on Instagram? I can give it to my wife and have that done. Uh, that would be, I think it'd be cool. Um, it'll be funny because I, I, I'll be shocked if any of you guys can predict what I picked. I, my wife was in, she, when I took it out of the box, she was like, what? <laughs> She just never in a million years thought that's what I was going to pick that those colors that way, uh, which is saying a lot. Uh, Don says, Hey, Phil, I just spent a week in Nashville and now have gas for a slashless Paul. I'm a bedroom player and it's a lot of money. Your thoughts. It is a lot of money. Uh, so there's, you know, obviously look, I, I don't want anybody to spend money. You don't have, that's not ever a smart move. Um, you know, these are luxury items and as such, they are wants, not needs. I don't feel like I should have to talk like that, but I just, I'm talking to you like my, my buddy, right? Right. I would say this thing there, my buddy. That means saying, look, if you can afford it, it's not the worst thing to do with your money. <laughs> this is what I'm trying to say. Uh, you know, they are cool guitars. Uh, I think, you know, you, especially now you can probably find some deals. Remember the market's soft a little bit, go out there and poke around. See if you, I, I always say this, a deal is not everything. Okay. And more importantly, a deal on something you don't want is not a deal. It's just something you don't want cheaper is just something you don't want cheaper, but you want one. Sometimes for me, if I want something and I'm talking like you, cause I'll, that's exactly how I talk. Like, man, I really want this, but how do I justify that expense? One of the best ways sometimes to justify the expense for me is see it, ask around with some dealers and see if there's a deal out there and then see if that deal kind of prompts it. Like, yeah, you know, that, that makes me feel a little better about this purchase. Um, and then sometimes if I really want it, it's not, I don't have to worry about that. I just go, but it sounds like your case, you want it. You just need to, to validate that expense. Maybe if you can find a discount, maybe if you can get rid of some gear that helps too. Something like that. Kevin Ramsey says, whatever happened to Dean Markley making guitar amps? My first amp was a K 20 with an eight inch speaker. I loved it. The only place I can find them is on reverb. Thanks. Uh, as always know your gear. Uh, you know, this is a, a conversation I had with my patrons on the last call last month. And so I got to find something to talk about this month, but we talked about amp companies and how amp companies are, they've been dying for years and going away. And, uh, whether you guys even know, I don't know if you know, Eggnator is now dissolved. It's no longer a brand. Eggnator amps is now, uh, officially gone. Um, the company that, that owned Eggnator, which is boutique amp brands is still around. So they're going to continue to make Morgan amps and they don't own Morgan. So I should send that they own Tone King, they own Synergy, which of course is basically the technology from Eggnator. Um, and they own Soldano. They own those three brands and then they make Friedman, they make Morgan. And then of course, Wampler and other brands too. But, uh, they've decided to dissolve the Eggnator brand. It was funny. That announcement came two days after I just told my patrons that, you know, we're losing amp brands like crazy and we're going to lose even more this year coming up. Um, because of the fact that it's a tougher, tougher market and it's becoming a, a tough market because of the fact there's a lot of great competition. Look, uh, uh, this, you know, look at the spark, look at the Yamaha THX, look at these amps. You can plug in these things and they sound great at lower volumes. You can plug in a software. Now there's a lot of competition from a lot of angles. And then of course you have also, you have an entire, uh, community of guitar players that as they get older, they become more established and affluent in their purchases. In other words, like, Hey man, you know, 20 years on the job, you know, Hey, when I'm going to buy myself for Christmas, I'm finally going to get this amp. You know what I mean? They're, they're you know, I'm going to buy a nice record player and $2,000 in records, right? I'm going to buy a $3,000 amp. You're seeing more of that stuff. And so they, they're not looking for those, all, all those amp deals all the time. And so a lot of companies are going to fall to the waistline. Uh, so Dean Markley is no difference. They were, uh, did those amps and they're, it's a tough market to be into the amp market. It's way tougher than guitars. It's way tougher than pedals. I would say out of the three categories, that is the toughest market in our industry to be in, compete in and stay in, uh, for a ton of reasons, because you're always fighting a couple problems. You're fighting trends right? Who's the, who's the in amp company now, right? Who's, you know, there's at one time it was Marshall and then it was Mesa Boogie and then it was Bogner, right? We're talking about, you know, everybody, the it brand, right? Two rock. There's always an it brand somewhere. Saldano was an it brand for a while. And then Friedman is probably definitely in the it brands right now. You know, you see, you know, just as inspiring people wanting those brands that you have to fight that the trends, and then you have to fight the 
economy market of amps, which is Fender, Line 6, you know, PV's still hanging on there. Um, uh, you know, I don't know, Behringer. I mean, you know, in the in the inexpensive, affordable amp market, I mean, there's just so many players. I um, will end on this. This is how we're going to end. Uh, 2003. Yep, I'm pretty sure I'm right. 2003, my father-in-law decided he wanted to learn guitar. I was very excited about this. So he bought a guitar, electric guitar. I decided it was uh, probably Christmas, all right? Could have been an anniversary or something like that. I decided I'm going to buy him an amplifier. Back in 2003, I wanted to spend, a, you know, I wanted to buy him an entry-level amplifier. I went to the local guitar center with $100 in my pocket. And in the guitar center, the large, very large, the largest one in our state out of the five stores, there was two. I'm not exaggerating. This is true. 2003. There was a crate, GT15. I think that sounds right. And the Behringer. <laughs> and I bought the crate. So he, I got a crate. Um, and they didn't have it, but there was also like a Randall. Now I want you to fast forward 2013. Okay. In 2013, it hit me one day in my store. Cause now 2003, I didn't have a store. 2013, decade later, I have a store. I have my own business in my store. Not in my, I didn't have a giant store in my store. It was like 3,000, 3,200 square feet, but it had lessons, you know, had lesson academy attached to it. In my store, one Christmas, I was looking and there was nine different $100 amps. We had the Mustang. We had the Line 6. We had the Rolling Cube. We had the, crate was gone, right? We had, uh, uh, you know, I don't know. There was a ton of them. Just, it was like insane. And how I thought of this was some lady came in the store and said, I'm looking for an amp for my, my son for Christmas. And what do you recommend? And I was like helping her and I'm like going through the amps and she wanted me to demo them. So I'm plugging in, I'm demoing one, <laughs> each one as I go down this row of amps and I'm laughing going, wow, we went from like, there was a couple to everyone now makes a hundred dollar amp, like everyone. And so that's my point, right? It's, it's, there's a lot of, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's the worst business to be in is the amp business in my opinion. They, the guitar players don't buy as many of them as they do guitars. They don't buy as many of them as they do pedals. For every guitar player, uh, throw in a generic number. We did once, we did a poll on this channel and we figured out the average guitar player that watches this show has 12 and a half guitars because they cut their guitar in half apparently. Anyways, uh, 12 guitars, you know, I, I didn't take a poll, but I'd be, I would be shocked if they have, if the same people that would answer that they have 12 guitars would say that they have less than 12 pedals. But I bet you the average amp, uh, own, uh, amp if it, in the high would be four. Right. So yeah, the amp business is a tougher business in the sections to be in. I think if I was going to, uh, you know, if somebody's like, Hey, I'm going to get in the guitar business. Like I would say, yeah, guitar, maybe pedals. I'd stay the hell away from amps. <laughs> so, um, plus the supporting businesses. Think about that when that's a big part of uh, the economy of this too, is the, you know, supporting business. So if you buy a guitar, you can buy a case that supports the case industry. If you buy a case, you buy a tuner, you buy a tuner, you buy, I mean, a cable cables for guitar, a guitar strap, uh, slides, as we talked about earlier, guitar, uh, a stand, you know, all these things. When somebody buys an amp, what are the supporting product lines for that? A cable? Well, a cable is also part of the supporting lines for a guitar. So maybe tubes, right? I mean, an amp stand is not a, a practical thing that most guitar players are going to have. Buying a guitar, an amp case is not a practical thing. Most people don't even buy amp covers. And if they do, it usually comes with the amp. So if you sell an amp, there's not a lot of supporting products. In fact, most of the supporting products are pedals the whole other business. <laughs> so like I said, uh, yeah, I think, uh, is, so to answer your question, what happened to Dean Markley amps, uh, like a lot of companies that got into amps, uh, they realized like, that's not the business you want to be in. I don't think I, one thing about this industry that constantly has been, I've constantly hear, which makes me chuckle is when people say, Oh, like they did it for the money <laughs> here all the time. <laughs> I'm not saying he was wrong there. That's true. Like company will say this company did it for the money, but I'm like, man, I have met so many people in this industry and I've talked to them for so long, not only for interviewing, but before friends and all the other ways. And I'm going to tell you, like I've met nice people. I've met horrible people. I've met funny people. I've met rude people, <laughs> met them all in this industry. But one thing they all had in common is passion because they wouldn't be here if that was, you can make money doing anything else but this way more money. This is not the industry for money. This is a passion industry first money second. So uh, some can hang with it and some can't because you got to realize if you're in it for the money, you're not going to make it. Uh, okay. Let's, uh, let's clear out those last couple questions. Um, 
Muhammad says, happy holidays. Just wanted to point out that the PRS is selling the 58 L 15 LTs and 85 15s flagship pickups on Sweetwater and limited run. I heard, yeah, they're doing like 2000. I read somewhere of the pickups. So yeah. Uh, sadly enough, I have, I don't want to give any opinions about those pickups for any reason than just to say this. My guess is they'll, if you think about getting a set, they're going to probably, everybody's going to buy a bunch and sell them for more later. I don't know. So it seems like the way to go with that stuff. Uh, Paul says, do you still use uh, the Duesenberg Les Paul trim you installed in your SG? Did it mark the guitar? Um, I love that Duesenberg trim. It is not on that SG. It is on Ralph's V. <laughs> so um, what happened was I bought a white uh, Gibson uh, V because um, I wanted a V. This <laughs> So I bought this V and then I thought, okay, well, I should put the trim on that V. I put it on the V and I thought it was cool. I liked it, but I liked it better on my SG. Man, I feel like I'm like, this is a cat in the hat moment. And then Ralph really, really wanted the, uh, the V. And I thought, well, I was at this point, it was just wall art. It wasn't being used. So I said, okay, why don't you buy it? Cause I got it for a smoking deal. So he bought it from me for what I paid for it. And then he took it and it had the tremolo on it. And I go, Ah, just let him have it. <laughs> so I'm, I gotta buy myself another Duesenberg uh, uh, bridge to put on the SG. So to answer your question, uh, did it mark the guitar? It could, cause it's lacquer. I mean, anything you're gonna put on the guitar, but I mean, that's something I would, is for me, that's acceptable. Like, you know, uh, that's what I love about an SG. That's, uh, you know, expensive, not expensive, whatever. SG to me is a guitar that like I, like I said, SG is like a pickup truck. Scratches, that's pride. You know what I mean? You know, I want, I want that guitar to look like it's worked. It's not a, it's not a piece of art. I don't, Somebody come over to your house and go, look at how pretty this SG is. No, like, SG means you're you're doing some business. You buy a truck because you're moving furniture, right? You're doing something with it. <laughs> so you're taking it, you know, you're going fishing. Some there's a reason for it. Same with SG. I feel like that's like a workhorse. So to answer your question, yeah, it would probably mark it. It didn't mark mine, it wasn't on long enough, but could mark it. But I would imagine that was uh, in my my mind, that's you know, one of the acceptable things I would tolerate. Uh, Mr. says lots of players in touring now, punk bands use Evertunes. I would imagine if you're touring, Evertunes are amazing. I, I told you guys this story. I went on an event with a bunch of YouTube channels and one of the YouTube channels was a sponsored artist with Evertune and they brought an Evertune guitar. They literally, I met them on the plane in Phoenix at Sky Harbor. Um, they came up to me and they said, hey, you're going to the event? And I go, oh man, you're going to the event. And we were started talking and it was great. And we got to sit each other on the plane and talk to each other all the way to, to, to Germany. And then we played the event and he came back. So obviously I was with him the whole time. He never tuned his guitar one time. <laughs> we were there for an, over a week. So that's a big climate change. Summertime, by the way, summertime, Arizona to, I think we went Arizona. I think it was like Phoenix to might've been Texas or Chicago. I can't remember wherever the layover was then to Amsterdam, Amsterdam and Germany, and then back backwards again, right? Germany, Amsterdam, Amsterdam, right? And, uh, literally, and Playing in front of people, we performed in front of people, different days. He never tuned that guitar once. So I'm a believer of the system. There's no question there. It's just, do I want it and would I use it? That's the question of doing a video for me uh, and maybe giving insight on it. Uh, last question I I see here. So let us let me verify that before I say last question. Second to last question. Two more questions and we're done. Uh, JC says, hey, Phil, do you have any thoughts on the reissue Epiphone Genesis from around 2014? Uh, and how do they compare to the modern Epiphone SC Pro, uh, Single Cut Pro? Um, you know, I probably put my hands on that guitar, just like a lot of guitars. It, I don't have any thoughts like I remember anything about it. I really like the new Epiphones. I really like the old Epiphones. I, I don't really have any insights for you. I really, sadly enough, I just wish I did, but I don't. So... Um, what I can tell you is, is that, uh, about how I purchase things like this. Like if I had it in my head to buy a 2014 Epiphone Genesis, like I have this all the time. I want these older guitars. What I've kind of learned is you might get lucky buy the guitar you wanted. That's from, you know, 10 years ago. Most of the time, it's not going to be what you wanted. You might as well just buy the new one. That's just my thoughts on that. I feel like Either way, you don't realize it because you're like, but I really want the thing I wanted. What I realize is either way, you're going to make a compromise. So something to think about there when you're thinking about your, you know, what, getting what you want. You either get the new one and it's not exactly like what you wanted or you get the old one and it's not in condition exactly like you wanted or it doesn't feel or play the way you wanted. So be prepared to, to be a little excited and disappointed either direction you go. That's the downfall of that. 
Uh, Grumpy Digga says, vet prisoner, soon to be Patreon su uh, supporter. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you for your service. Chances of older, older humbuckers set. Wait, chances of, oh, ordering a humbucker set to Australia. Uh, you and the family stay strong, USA Army and uh, to Australian Army brothers. So, uh, again, thank you for the question. Um, do we ship, I guess, uh, ordering a set to Australia? Um, we do. Uh, what happens is if you uh, contact us through the Blackstock site, it goes to Shauna. That's my wife. Shauna will then, uh, she, it always works the same way. She goes, somebody wants one, blah, blah, blah. And then she just tells me and then she's handling it. She does the process. So yeah, that can be done. Um, what I will tell you is if you're thinking about getting some black stock pickups, um, if you can wait to February, there's an announcement on February that will be exciting for pickups, uh, for the black stock pickups. So uh, I'm not going to say it's going to blow anybody's mind, but I'm just going to say, you know, hey, it might be more beneficial to wait. Um, so if you wait till February, if you can, if you can't, it's not like it's like the the, the quality is going up in February. Just we're going to have more options and different price choices. So just be aware of that. All right. On that note, I'm going to let you guys go. Uh, I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. Uh, and uh, thank you, everyone, for questions. Thank you, everyone, for submitting questions that I didn't see. But like I said, the good news now is when you submit those questions in these chats and stuff, we're scooping those out. And you'll see that soon. Uh, in videos. So like I said, or reading them in other episodes. So like I said, we're, it's really cool. Uh, I want to thank everybody for helping that. Thank you guys, everybody who uh, goes and says, gives a thumbs up to my daughter's high school video. And uh, I appreciate you guys supporting her and getting her extra credit. Uh, I appreciate that. And uh, uh, that's it. I think that's it. Is that the other announcements? I think that's it for announcements. Enjoy your guys' rest of the weekend, play some guitar, and I will see you guys next Friday. And I will eventually find the button that lets